Essentially, if you, you sign on a document and if the deal goes sideways, the bank can go after everything you own. So, I so would, if the business can't pay back the loan, then they can go back and get your house or your other assets. Yep, they can go after you know your ugly Christmas sweater to your coin collection to your bank account. People that have grit, people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and really get into the trenches and figure it out. That no matter what happens, they're willing to just roll up their sleeves and persevere. My boss, my head marketing, and my head compliance hitting my Twitter account like every two days. So I basically was like shitting myself like, hey, I'm gonna fucking get fired here. Like I, that was- They're viewing your profile every like, two days. every two days. I checked my bank account this morning. I didn't get a paycheck from them, so. Okay. <laughs> Coming but in. But I, I did get a, a bigger paycheck from a deal that I just closed. Oh, so. you did? Yeah. Matthias, thanks for coming down to Atlanta for the podcast. It's great to have you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, how's it been? How's it been your first time here in Atlanta? First time here, um, actually being in the city. I mean, I've gone through the airport lots of times. You know, the, the customs agents here like to hustle people through the, through the customs. So it, it's my, actually one of my least favorite airports. But yeah, back to your question, Nathan. First time here, boots on the ground being in the city. Well, I've been really looking forward to this podcast because I know how capable you are in the the industry of acquisition and entrepreneurship. And that's my main bread and butter of what I focus on. So I've edit, I've uh, podcasted with five guests so far, and they've been all content creators, which I love. But I honestly thought you were just a podcast guy doing ETA instead of the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what some people think about me. They say, hey, is Nate an influencer or is he actually doing deals? But no, I actually am doing deals. And that's my main business is, uh, is ETA. So that's why it's really great to have a fellow comrade in the industry coming in um, and giving a lot of hopeful information for our audience on ETA and especially on the debt financing side of deals. Well, it's good to be here with you and the Buddha over your right shoulder. So th <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. So I guess, you know, before we kind of jump into your background, I want to kind of hear your story. We've got a long form podcast here. Um, just quickly, how would you summarize what you do to an audience, maybe someone that's new to ETA, entrepreneurship through acquisition, um, someone that maybe it's like just kind of learning the ropes? Like, how would you say, what, what, what's your main job? What do you do? Yeah. So, so basically what I do, Nathan, is I help the searcher with accelerating the process of going through the SBA financing process from point to point B. So you have all these different banks out there that do SBA financing for business acquisition, so search fund lending, but not all of them are good and capable. And each of them has their own kind of distinct credit box, meaning the different types of deals that they do and don't want to finance based on a compilation of factors ranging from the industry, the debt service coverage of the deal, how the borrower's down payment structure is all cash, or is the borrower using some combination of cash and seller holdback debt on partial or full standby? along with the percentage of the, the SBA financing relative to the total use of funds. So essentially what I do is I help the searcher or the business buyer, searcher, you know, we're all searchers philosophically, help the searcher find the right bank for the deal and then be involved from point to point B to make sure it goes quickly and efficiently. So kind of being the advocate or the liaison in their corner between them and the bank. This is why I love talking to you because even when we were at the bar yesterday or two days ago, I can't remember now, um, you have so much knowledge and there's, there's a lot there. Like, I think for some people in the audience, some people may not even know what search is. I'm glad you think that I'm knowledgeable because my wife thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I want to peel that back a little bit just for the audience, for people that may not even know what search is. What, what is search? What are we talking about here? Um, so I guess what I would say is, you know, obviously what you do is you help people that are trying to buy a small business to finance the cost of that acquisition. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the government through the Small Business Association, the SBA loan program, will basically guarantee or semi-guarantee loans. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. So that acquisition entrepreneurs that want to buy a small business in Columbus, Ohio, or Atlanta, Georgia, or- Fuck Ohio, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, so it's like anywhere in the United States really can buy up to $5 million um, 
business or loan amount and, and kind of get favorable terms. Is that is that kind of the idea behind this? Yeah, correct. So so the SBA, I guess, just to give give a quick history yeah. lesson here for the listeners um, or, or viewers, started back in the 1950s. And so essentially the Small Business Administration's 7A loan program um, originates or provides SBA loans up to $5 million. And essentially the SBA acts more or less as the equivalent of an insurance company backstopping the loan. So most of the time it's 75% of the loan that they'll backstop. If you're buying a business that has an international trade dimension to it that sells you know, to Mexico, Canada, Argentina, wherever, essentially that can qualify for 90% guarantee versus 75%. And the way that these banks make money is most of them will sell the guaranteed portion on the secondary market and they'll get a premium from the bond market investors. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. We're going to get into that. I think, you know, what I'm going to probably call this podcast is a masterclass in acquisition uh, debt finance. And so we're going to go into some of those really advanced topics later on in the podcast. I think this is going to be a pretty long one. Um, before we do that, though, I kind of want to warm up the audience and kind of just start from a, a very basic foundational level and also get into your story and who you are as a person and the firm that you've recently created. Uh, you know, the podcast is called Break the Formula, which is about people that break the formula, i.e. they leave their corporate job, their nine to five, maybe they're not feeling fulfilled, and they do something entrepreneurial. And I think that's totally your story. But I've only gotten to know you, you know, a little bit through Twitter, through LinkedIn, uh, through calls. And then now we've been able to meet in person over the last couple of days here in Atlanta. So that's been a real pleasure. But for the audience, I guess, you know, where, where are you from originally? And yeah, kind of like, what's your, what's your background? Where did you grow up? Where'd you go to school? What'd you study? Yeah. All that type of stuff. Yeah. So I, I grew up, um, well, was born in Lexington, Massachusetts. So 1993, um, my dad's a university professor, teaches graduate level economics. So grew up there, was born in Massachusetts, lived there from age zero to age five. Don't remember a whole lot of that. So I spent most of my childhood in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, so 98 through 2010. And basically kind of, you know, grew up in a household where my, my mom stayed at home, my dad worked, um, spent lots of time doing outdoors stuff, ranging from being the Boy Scouts, you know, riding bikes, um, shooting guns at summer camp, <laughs> um, water skiing, things of that nature. But yeah, so Ann Arbor, Michigan is where I kind of spent most of my childhood and then moved to Masson, Wisconsin, right before my last year of high school, where I met my now wife back in August of 2010. And went to the University of Wisconsin Madison, graduated from there with a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics, and so that's got my background, kind of getting to when I started working. Fascinating. Um, actually, interestingly enough, episode three, so a couple episodes ago, we had a guy from as well, University of Madison, Wisconsin, as well. So a couple of people from the Midwest out here. Yeah, on the podcast. Midwest is an awesome spot, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Tell me a little bit more about why you chose economics to study. And then also, um, were you doing internships and, and kind of what was your path to getting your first full-time job? Yeah, no, for sure. So what, so why I chose economics to begin with? Um, so I, I started college at the university of Wisconsin lacrosse, transferred to Madison and essentially getting into the business school there is a very competitive process where it's easier if you start out at Madison and then applied directly. Long story short, I didn't get into the business school I applied. So I looked at, you know, if I want to get into banking, indoor financial services, what's the next best major to go into? And economics kind of seemed like a natural fit. Um, what was the other part of the question that you had? Yeah, and then at that point when you were in school, were you trying to get a bunch of internships at banks or financial institutions? And then what kind of was your full-time job out of school? Yeah. So during the summer, so basically I, I looked at a couple of different internships. Um, I actually spent the first two summers during college as a lifeguard, partly due to the fact that I just didn't want to, you know, spend all, spend all summer working away in a cubicle. It, it just seemed more fun. You know, there's typically attractive women at the pool. <laughs> it, it's honestly just more, it's more interesting than just sitting in an office all day. So I, I did do some intern stuff or internship stuff in college. I worked for a company called Course Hero. 
basically going around campus and more or less helping the Coursera company make online sets of class notes for students in different courses. So basically going around campus, scanning people's notes on my Android tablet. And basically for every, I think it was every 10 sets of lecture notes, I'd get 10 bucks for completing a class. And so basically farming all these notes into these online kind of course sets for this company, Coursera. So, and then from there, my first job of college was working at a bank based out of the Milwaukee area in Economwalk that was called First Bank Financial Center. Um, now it's called Bank 59. So working there as a commercial associate, more or less kind of middle slash back office SB lending operations, helping with everything from kind of some credit analysis, but not really more in the deal execution kind of deal fulfillment side, um, working deals after they get approved and kept packaging them, you know, loan file stuff, compliance, business insurance, down payment documentation, things like that. Amazing. So was that something that you always wanted to do? Like, had you been aware of the SBA loan program or even just were you familiar with like commercial lending in general as a business? And was that a target area or were you trying to do just broad finance and then yeah. ended up there? How, how did that kind of Come so play. yeah, good question. So I wanted to actually get an investment banking, but I didn't get in. Um, I answered interestingly enough for a compliance analyst position in Goldman Sachs. It was gaming division in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I got to the second round interview. This was virtual, but didn't make it onto the final cut. So the the way that I ended up in this first job of college in SBA financing was completely random. I did not even know what this was. So it was my fourth interview of the day. I interviewed, I think it was for Kohl's, like the, the retailer clothing store in the morning. And then it was like a trading desk job. And I think it was something Associated Bank was the third one. And this was my last interview of the day. So I walked in and I basically met my former boss. His name was Brent. And we just kind of hit it off. So like, it, you know, kind of when you meet someone for the first time and you can tell there's a synergy, we just kind of had that. If that makes sense. Really? And so for you, like, you didn't really know what the SBA program was. You were trying to do like trading or investment banking and all, all these other types of roles. So for yeah. you, this probably wasn't even the top of your list. This was kind of like Th this was this was the bottom. And in all honesty, <laughs> in all honesty, it's this was your backup. Yeah. In all honesty, like there were kind of irons in the fire that I was exploring at this point in time. So essentially the point in time I had an offer from this bank, they were kind of more trying to reel me in. Than the opposite, which is counterintuitive because, you know, you think your first job of college, you, you, you should be desperate. But I basically there are a couple of different opportunities I could have waited and acted on. But I just saw lots of upside to learn from this guy that was kind of younger and just seeing the, you know, the variety of transactions that were going on. So like when I was there in my second round interview, I think he was working on it was like a manufacturing company or some like international sales thing. And like shit was flying like five different ways and he was talking to his boss. And I just thought this seems like it could be an interesting opportunity. So yeah, that's that's fascinating. I don't think a lot of people think about commercial lending as like a sexy kind of industry, you know, in terms of high finance, as people call it, right? Yeah. They were thinking about trading, they're thinking about stock market, but uh it definitely is seems like a very interesting field. It it's interesting, man. I mean, and we'll probably get into it a little bit further along, but in these SB deals, it could be everything from someone buying a business that has like aphrodisiacs in it for having a sexy time. So like you could be buying an HVAC company. And so there's so many different um, business targets or businesses. So you're, you're saying it's boring. Is that, is that what you meant to say there? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's boring. If it's any, not sexy. If, if anyone's boring. watching this that's contemplating SBA, just don't do it. it. It sucks. It's boring. It's stupid. So yeah, completely boring. Yeah. <laughs> but is that what you meant to say? Because you said some of these industries like HVAC, yeah. So yeah. yeah so what, what I meant to say is there's so many different opportunities out there as a buyer and like that you can work on from the deal side of working in a bank. Yeah. That you get a lot of exposure to all these different companies very quickly. Whereas when you go into like an investment bank, not to poo-poo on investment banking because there are great opportunities that you can get out of it. I think you yourself works in that background, not to flip the table here, but um, you get stuck more or less in a division as I understand it, right? It could be. Yeah. Uh, TMT or like industrials or mining or whatever, and you're working with 
businesses that are based in that industry subsector. Whereas for me, for example, I think the first deal I worked on was someone buying a self storage. And then after that, I was working on gas stations with like Indian buyers, not the, the ethnicity matters there, but just to throw that out there. Um, to people buying like manufacturing companies and just getting to see all these different um, types of industries, the backgrounds of the buyers, getting to meet people coming to the office. There was one time these Marines came in and they set up an M4 rifle on the table in the conference room and they were looking for an inventory loan to buy bump stocks. So all different types of stuff. To buy, to buy what? To, to buy bump stocks. So it's like a stock of a gun that you attach to the back of the rifle that basically mounts your shoulder. Wow. Yeah. That is crazy. It's crazy. I walked in, I took a piss at the urinal, walked into the office, and there was a rifle just literally pointed at me when I was walking into the conference room. It's pretty wild. <laughs> that is wild. Yeah. That is wild. Um, kind of just like finishing up on, in terms of your, your student experience. Were you a good student? Did you have a good GPA? Uh, were you somebody that yeah. liked to study or were you kind of like not really into it? Kind of what was your background there? Yeah, so I did better actually the first school that I, I went to um, at, at UW Lacrosse because it was kind of a lower ratio of students. Yeah. <laughs> what was obnoxious? <laughs> You're obnoxious. Oh, the train? The, the motor, yeah. We're good. We're good with some background. Oh, it's, yeah. it's all good. Was, yeah. We got some moto gangs here yeah. in, in Atlanta. So. Same question What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're good. We're good. Is this um, how the mic should be angled like that? Yeah. Okay. Camera's still running, right? Yeah. Okay, Camera's perfect. Yeah. I think what we were talking about was um, yeah, whether you're a good student, whether you were studious. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was very studious, Nathan. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. So I, I think my. I mean, you were a course hero. So that's, you must. I was a course hero. Yeah. Yeah. That indeed I was. Um, so I, I think my freshman year, I had like a 3.7 or 3.8. When I transferred to Mass in like my first year that I was there, I, I did pretty well. But then like I kind of loaded up with some of the more difficult classes um, in my second semester, my second year there. And then my third year, I was trying to cruise through to graduate early. So my, my GPA did take a bit of a hit, but I ended up with something in the threes. I can't remember exactly what. You seem like a pretty intelligent person. I, I would like to think so. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were some of your favorite courses, actually? Um, you said you were doing some harder courses. Was that economics, things yeah. like that? Yeah, so some of the more interesting classes that I took. So there was one that was like the economics of money and banking and understanding how, you know, fractional reserve banking works. You have like some of the macroeconomic stuff with the Fed. Um, the, some of the classes outside my major were pretty interesting too, like philosophy, you know, learning how to think about different things. Is this right? Is this wrong? Taking different sides of opinions on different issues, like should we be eating meat and killing animals and slaughterhouses and things like that? Um, and then other stuff too, like African studies and learning about like the colonization of Africa. And like, you know, basically after colonization, how th some things have devolved in different countries. So I, I'd say like both classes within economics. Um, another one was the economics of education and understanding basically about, you know, how important education is to society and like making people smart, things like that. I can't remember everything in, in college, just right. given them about a decade removed at this point. <laughs> Sorry, professors. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I'd say both the classes within economics and also some of the ones that were like outside of that. So the, the ones I just mentioned. Yeah, it's, that's fascinating. Um, economics is very, very fascinating. I also minored in economics. Yeah. I studied finance. But uh, um, do you think, you know, I'm really curious, something that I think about a lot is the relevance of university education in terms of career development. and do you feel that those courses, because it seems like, you know, you learned a lot in those courses, do you think that kind of feeds into yourself and your own personal development and or your own career development um, for what you're doing now and SBA lending and deals? Yeah, so I, I think for getting the, so is the question kind of more to getting in the door or like, is it useful directly with what I do? Yeah, now? it's useful directly. Like, do you feel like that education was useful for what you're doing now? 
Yeah, so I, I think yes in a way. I, I think kind of understanding how to think critically and analytically um, and then also like how to do good, you know, well-written written communication. I think for that kind of part of what I do now, it's very important. I think the course hero internship and some of the more kind of real world things actually have been more valuable. You know, knowing how to hustle, knowing how to sell, knowing how to pitch the value proposition behind the business. But back to your question, I think generally speaking, like being able to write well is very important. You learn that in school or college as you probably call it in Canada, university here in the States. Um, but I think also to the economic stuff like Excel, knowing how to just think rationally and model different situations can be useful. So, but some of the more technical things like physics or calculus, no, I mean, I hate to say that it was a waste of time taking those classes, but it kind of was because for me, I just haven't really used that. But if you're going into a STEM field like in, um, engineering or math or something like that, it could be very valuable. Yeah, I remember when I was at school, I went to school in Canada in a town called Waterloo. Um, and we did this course at one point. It was like an extra course you had to apply for that was basically like applied financial modeling. And we had to analyze three different companies over a year and write a memo about the business and also do a full financial model with a lot of assumptions and present those uh, theses or the, these pitches basically to the professors. Interesting. And that was probably the most useful course I took. Because I took some financial, you know, some advanced financial analysis uh, courses, quantitative finance, things like that. But yeah. I don't really use those day to day. But those core skills, like you mentioned, of writing, critical thinking, financial modeling, Microsoft Excel, those are critical to even what I'm doing today. Yeah. And, and Kev, leapfrogging off that comment, Kev, going back to when you asked about um, my college education, I honestly think it's for the better that I didn't go to the business school because I think having more of the liberal arts, well-rounded education, English classes, some of these more diverse experiences helps you get a better grasp of the world. Not to poo-poo on people that have like a bachelor's of business administration, but they miss out on a lot of these different classes where you get more of a well-rounded understanding of, of the world. So, Yeah, I would agree because in the real world, and even for, for someone that's a searcher, someone that's an acquisition entrepreneur, right. for example, when they're going out into the world and they're trying to think of an industry or buy a business and learn about a new sector and think about risk and all this type of stuff, there's a lot of nuance to that that I don't think in business classes one can appreciate. If, uh, you know, I don't know if yeah. you know what I mean. It's like you know, everything in business class is pretty straightforward. You put right. the assumptions, you put the mo you know, you do the, the formulas. Yeah, but the real world is very different from that. Would they, you say so? And and there are things that you just can't fit into these models, Nathan. Like you know, for example, you could be a searcher buying a landscaping company, and you have a tech that takes a shit in someone's front yard, and you can't <laughs> model you can't model the outcome of that on your P and L statement until it happens in real life. Has that happened? So sorry, tell me more about that. So <laughs> what's that? So you you buy a landscaping business? Yeah. And then, and then, so what was that? Yeah, yeah so there, there was a guy on Twitter, a well-known person on Twitter, his name's Nolan Gore. I, I think it was his tweet where he referenced he had a lane. Shout out to Nolan. Shout out to Nolan. Great, yeah. great tweet, Nolan. He, he had a, do you call them landscaping techs or land, landscaper? He had a landscaper in his landscaping company. Yeah, an employee that, working for an him. An employee that, that took a dump, like, like a shit in someone's yard. And a got customer's yard. In someone's yard. Well, on the yard in in the yard, I, I guess on the yard, unless you use a trowel and then it's technically in the yard. Kev, like you digging the Panama Canal in your Nutella jar right before we started the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. But yeah, he took a shit on this person's yard. And then the, you know, the homeowner had a video system, recorded this, reached out, hey, your employee, because shit in my front yard, I'd like, I, I'd like to kind of figure this out with you. You can't, you can't model that in like an right. LBO model, right? Because that's an unknown factor. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, in business, a lot of unexpected things can happen. Right. Uh, both on the, the downside and the upside. But there's, yeah, reality is very different from what you put in a straight line financial model over a five year period or whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a crazy story, though. I've never, I've never heard of that. Okay. So, so that's, I think that's a really great background for the audience to understand kind of your thought process, your background in terms of your education, where you grew up. Um, Tell me more about, 
you were you were kind of mentioning some really interesting aspects of your first job. Yeah. So you're working at a bank in was it Milwaukee? Yeah, I worked at a bank uh, based in Economowoc, Wisconsin, so a suburb of Milwaukee, about 30 minutes outside of there. Um, you know, kept nice, affluent town, lots of lakes, lake country. Um, I think this bank, for whatever is worth, was like, or yeah, for whatever it may be worth, is like the second oldest bank in Wisconsin. Had been around six years before the start of the Civil War, so kind of like wow. crusty, arcane, like historic vibe there and they were really big on commercial real estate lending so you know say you nathan want to buy a self-storage facility that's an asset that they'd lend to or maybe you own a shout out to my my friend here in atlanta tyler who's doing a whole uh self-storage uh roll up right now so actually yeah. i should connect him to you or or, uh, or nick huber he's a self-storage guy too based not too far from here right um but yeah so they, they would do commercial real estate acquisitions so someone buying self-storage or maybe you own a manufacturing company and you're leasing the, the business or sorry, leasing the building and you want to buy the business, something like that. They didn't do a whole lot of M&A financing, which is kind of what I went on to do later when I went to Byline Bank, but they were really prolific in the commercial kind of owner-occupied real estate space. So, so they liked more uh kind of funding uh, acquisitions or loans for kind of asset heavy kind of real yeah, estate, correct. tangible assets that type, like more balance sheet lending. Yeah. And, and the philosophy there came back to the, like the chief lending officer who used to be a workout guy, basically having to liquidate stuff is if, if shit goes sideways, you have a tangible asset that you can put a dollar peg or kind of dollar value on that you can get liquidation or yeah, no, I, I, I get so, that. And I, and I think that's a really interesting aspect of the SBA loan program is that I think it really gives banks more confidence, more security to invest in a business that may not have a lot of assets. Yeah. But they've got cash flow and they're lending on cash flow, which, you, you know, things can change and you never know. Would you yep. agree with that? I, I completely would. And I mean, I myself, philosophically, I think there's something to be said more about placing more weight on the search fund lending model where you have the historical, hopefully historical cash flow there for the loan repayment versus looking at the asset-based lending model where you're just looking at accounts receivable or tangible asset. Because at the end of the day, it's the cash flow that repays a loan. If you're thinking about the collateral, you know, you're already thinking about the default. And obviously, as a bank, you have to hedge the downside risk. But at the end of the day, cash flow is king. No, that's a, that's a really great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so how long were you at that first bank? What was that first bank called? Yeah. In Milwaukee yeah, so it was, area? It was actually called First Bank Financial Center. So okay. First Bank, First Bank Financial Center. So that was your first bank, First yep. Bank Financial Center. And so how long were you working there? Yeah, so I, I was there from March of 2015 through late late January of uh, late late January of 2018. About uh, just almost, just under three years, more or less. Yeah, about two or three years, and then and then kind of what what happened at that point? What were you looking to do? You said you moved to a different firm. Yeah, yeah. So so basically, what happened actually? So I had been promoted the summer before to be a lender business development officer. But I was still basically kind of stuck doing all the back office bullshit, more or less. So I got a, a pay raise. I think I was making like fifty eight initially, and then I got bumped to like seventy thousand. It, it was somewhere in that neighborhood, more or less. And long story short, was I got saddled doing all the back office crap, and the bank was kind of more or less pulling out of having a physical presence in the Mass and Milwaukee office. So unfortunately, I got let go from that first mm. job. So from there, I basically was applying for other SBA lending shops in, in the Wisconsin market and actually driving Uber, um, of all things, between that and going on to my next job, which is Byline Bank. So I, I have some pretty impeccable Uber stories. I mean, for, <laughs> for about six weeks of my life, I was driving Uber seven days a week, 12 to 13 hours a day, doing everything from picking a lady up at a snowbank driving. Um, there was some judge, I think, in the Wisconsin Supreme Court that Uber drove to some house party. Um, Wisconsin basketball players, people running from the cops, all different types of things. So, 
Milwaukee Bucks, uh, some of those no guys. No Milwaukee Bucks people. This is Mass, and I don't, I don't know if those people yeah. uh, take Ubers around downtown Mass. You were, you were uh, Ubering Giannis around? I don't think he was there at the no, time. No, he, but... he probably would have been too tall for my car. So he, <laughs> he probably would need the sunroof to be like a brain. <laughs> That's wild. So you were kind of unemployed for a couple, how long? You said it was three months? No, not three months. It was, um, so it was end of January. It's like March 19th. Um, I think was when I started Byline Bank. So about six weeks, more or less. Wow. And so you were just interviewing. You didn't know what was going to happen. And then you, f- you finally got the offer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So when went from that bank to Byline. Th- shout out to Tom Lyons at Byline for giving me the, sh- the shot to come over there. So Tom was a lender in the Mass in Wisconsin um, office that actually connected me in with Byline. So my first job there so second job out of college, which was working as a closer, so middle office guy. Interesting. Um, for those that aren't aware of how these banks work, yeah. regional banks, and you kind of contrast, so you mentioned the first role, you were really focused on back office processes. You were kind of bored of that. Yeah. And then, and then you said you went to becoming more of a closer. How does that all work? Yeah, yeah, g- good question there. So the first bank that I was at um, was less regimented in terms of what different people were doing. So they had, you know, the lender that I was working with, Brent, he was getting the deal into credit and approved. And that was kind of his conduit liaison of sorts for helping assemble the post-approval documentation, collecting various paperwork streams, clearing post-closing loan exceptions. But they didn't really have the portfolio manager type role that some of these more established larger SBA banks like Byline, Live Oak, et cetera, have. So um, back to your question or what I think it was, essentially most of these national SBA banks, they have the lender who's the relationship manager that meets the client, brings in the lending opportunity. And basically once it goes from the, once the lender kind of does their initial pre-screen short version credit memo, it goes to the underwriter that works directly with the client. And they basically work on putting together the full blown credit memo then it goes from the underwriter once the deal is approved to the closer. So that was the role that I applied for and got byline. And basically the closer oversees the whole work stream logistics flow from approval through to closing. So basically interfacing with the title company, collecting corporate documentation, down payment documentation, business insurance, life insurance, uh, lease agreements, things like that. And then after the deals close, it then goes to the portfolio manager who works in the bank servicing department and oversees the longer term client relationship. So like if you can't make your loan payment, if you're selling the building where your business is based, maybe your building's collateral on the loan, perhaps your house is collateral on the loan and you need to get, you're selling your house. So you need to swap the lien to a new house or something like that. So one department is really focused on bringing in new business, new deals, trying yep. to get that through credit. Yeah. Then, so the, the the lending department. Yeah. And then you were you were when you went to become a closer, you were kind of in the middle. You're helping to actually facilitate the close and then passing it on to the portfolio uh, manager. Is that kind of how it works? Correct. Yeah. And it, it for anyone watching this, interesting getting to getting into SBA lending, the closing role is pretty great, even if you want to move to the front office at, at some point. Because you get all this kind of connection and ability to work directly with the client, even in the non-sales role. So just getting that exposure, getting to work with the intermediaries. So like in this case, someone like myself, the loan consultant or loan broker, whatever you want to call me, Twitter shit poster, um, and or the M&A attorney can kind have of different people involved in the deal. Fascinating. And so you went to Byline, you moved cities, you went up to Madison. Um, and then from that point on, what was your experience there? What type of deals were you seeing? Yeah. Yeah. So just to clarify one point there. So I was not living in Oconomowoc. I, I was, um, when I was at my first bank, I was working in an office in Madison. Got it. So yeah, it, in Madison or was working in Madison, both at first, first, uh, first bank financial center and then byline. Um, so basically, yeah, went from there, kind of working at, or working on commercial real estate deals at First Bank Financial Center to working on more all different types of deals from M&A, search fund type deals at Byline to ground up new construction, debt refinance deals, all those different types of things. 
And what was that like for you from a learning experience perspective? Yeah. It was kind of like being thrown back into the deep end. I mean, it's like, you know, so initially when I went to my first job at um, First Bank Financial Center, I keep wanting to say First Business Bank, which is my last bank I was at. Um, so initially kept going there in my first job of college. You kind of feel like you get thrown into the deep end. You're metaphorically drinking a fire hose, just trying to absorb as much knowledge as you can as fast as you can, hoping that you don't get fired or fail. But essentially, a lot of what I was doing at the first job was just the real estate deals. So all of a sudden, kind of trying to understand like how does cash flow work? What are the, you know, what is an asset purchase agreement? What's a stock purchase agreement? Understanding all the ins and outs of that as it pertains specifically to my job. Just since up to that point, it had only been real estate purchase agreements I was working with. And then on the debt refinance side, there's a whole section of the SBA guidelines dedicated solely to that type of deal. So basically trying to become familiarized with that just versus what I've been doing before. And I think I would assume that for these cash flow acquisitions, the business acquisitions, there's a lot more focus on debt service coverage ratios and other other kind of ratios based on cash flow. Correct. Is yep. that right? Yeah. Yeah, completely correct there. So basically the SBA guidelines, you have to have at least 15% cash flow, so 1.15 debt service coverage over and above bank loan payments, so SBA loan payments plus seller note payments. Although I recommend getting above that because that, that's kind of shitty. It's the, the low bar. Yeah, on a deal I was working on recently, I think they told me 1.25 yeah. debt yep. service. Sounds like a familiar limit. deal. <laughs> <laughs> you might know the banker, actually. Yeah, I, I might know the bank and, and, and the deal. So. It seems like you know. Actually, here's a question I would want to ask: Is how many SBA banks are there? Hundreds in the U.S. Hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah, I don't know the exact number. I feel like I should. And how does one become? Is there like a certification process that these banks go through? Honestly, no, not not really. So it's just any bank, any licensed bank. And essentially lend and have the SBA uh, if they follow the guidelines. Correct. Guarantee yeah. a portion of the loan amount. Yeah. So more or less, I mean, just kind of generalizing here, almost any bank can do SBA loans. So there's when you start out as a bank and you want to do SBA loans, you're what's called a, a general processing bank. So you're non preferred SBA lender. Excuse me. Sorry. Maybe we got that. <laughs> no, that's all um, good. So <laughs> sorry. So basically, you're non preferred SBA lender and you have to submit the loan file directly to the SBA's California office to get them to review and approve it. And so that can add anywhere from three to four weeks, if not more, onto the process. But from there, Nathan, you can become what's called a preferred SBA lender after you go through, through that process and a number of files. So the bank carries that license. The lender themselves is not licensed. I mean, I would argue that any competent person off the street, like right now we're shooting this in Atlanta, I, I could grab a student from Emory University and I could teach them how to do SBA lending in like six to seven weeks. I mean, you just basically need to not be an idiot. And like you I mean, you have someone at Emory, I think. You've, yeah, you've, right. You have on your team, yeah, sort of, I have, right? Right. I have, yeah. my, I have my intern, Jake. Shout out to Jake. Um, but yeah, anyone that's, you know, anyone that's not an idiot that's willing to work hard and grind, you can teach them SBA lending. They just need to be a good communicator, good with numbers, and have a passion for working with people. Very interesting. So you mentioned something actually also interesting there. You said there's certain banks that are preferred SBA lenders, lending institutions. There's some that aren't. Correct. Yep. And how do you, how do you know which one's which? Yeah, so you can look. So sometimes the bank on their website, they'll mention that they're a preferred SBA lender. You can also go on to the SBA's website itself to validate that. I'm not sure exactly what's happened, but you could just type in, you know, insert bank name, preferred SBA lender to see if it comes up. And or you can also just go on Google and type in preferred SBA lenders in such and such state. With that being said, most of these banks that do lots of SBA lending whether it be the search fund lending, have like what you're doing with your deal, or banks like my first employer of college, First Bank Financial Center, they will lend nationally. So the state of the bank is not super relevant to the deal. Got it. Very cool. Um, you know, for the audience, for again, kind of thinking about people that may not be practitioners yet, they're not entering 
the acquisition space yet, but they're very curious. Why should they care about SBA lending? Why should they work with someone like yourself, who is a, a loan advisor, a loan consultant for SBA? Yes. What's the benefit of all this? Yes, it's so kind of technical. It's a little bit boring for some yeah. people. For me, it's fascinating. But overall, they might say, why do I care? Yeah, so answering your question first about why should they care about SBA lending. So you're buying a business for the first time. I mean, there are several different ways you can finance it, not to overgeneralize here. One is you could pay all cash for it if you're fortunate not to be in that position and are either personally wealthy and or have wealthy family, friends, et cetera. Another way is you could do what's called seller financing. And essentially, the seller more or less acts as the bank and you make payments to them over a period of time. Maybe you do a down payment up front until at whatever point in time you've paid them the purchase price of the business. And then the last way is essentially you, you buy the business using a loan. Most banks that are not SBA lenders, generally speaking, on the segment of the market that I'm working with, so people buying companies up to $8 million purchase price or enterprise value, user terminology, they, they don't have the ability to go to a non-SBA bank to get funded because most of these banks are looking at the hard collateral of the actual business itself versus the cash flow. And they're very much more prioritizing the collateral. So by going to an SBA bank, you open up the possibility of your likelihood to get funded versus a non-SBA bank. Um, the second part of your question, as I understand it, is why I work with someone like myself versus doing this on your own? Yeah, we can get into that. We can okay. get into that. But uh, I think that's, yeah, that, that's a good, that was a great summary you made. And I, I think how I would share that in very uh, layman's terms is that most banks are not willing to finance a $5 million acquisition of a business that doesn't have a lot of assets. So if they're buying, I don't know, you'd know more than me about specific deals, but I'm assuming a landscaping business that maybe has a million dollars of annual cash flow, uh, you're buying that for $5 million, that business might only have half a million dollars worth of assets, which might be equipment, might be some trucks. They don't have any hard assets, right? Correct. It's, to back that loan. Yeah. So you're going to have, I mean, just spitballing here, you know, there might be some laptops, there could be some office equipment, there could be some trucks, um, whatever you call those things that you put trees into them that like mulches it, mulchers or whatever. So you're, you're probably going to have maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars in various vehicles, equipment of that nature. And you know, liquid assets as well. Yeah. Yeah. Liquid assets. Um, and basically, the most of these banks, the non-SBA types, you know, you'll go to them, you'll reach out. There's gonna be someone with gray hair and a tie that will answer the front door, and they're gonna look at the business, and they're basically going to say, "This is a big airball deal." There's no, you know, you're buying a business for five million. There's only three hundred thousand of of assets. What's gonna happen if if this thing goes bad, right? Like we're gonna take a four point seven million dollar loss. And due to the fact that they are an SBA bank, like they're literally going to take that as a loss in the balance sheet. Whereas if you flip the coin and it's an SBA bank, the SBA is backstopping 75% of the loan amount. So the bank's exposure is more or less whatever the um, is more or less whatever the 25% of the loan amount would be less the hard assets. Yeah. So, so I guess in that case, like, let's say that I'm trying to buy that landscaping business for $5 million, five times EBITDA. You want to buy, you want to buy a landscaping company now? I thought I, we were, <laughs> I don't, All right. I'm not, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I'm just saying as an example. So, so you have this business, it's done a million dollars in cash flow or EBITDA. So people call it operating income, uh, essentially earnings before taxes. You know, it's been doing about a million every year for the last couple of years. Right. And the owner's willing to sell it five times, which is not bad, I guess. Right. Yeah, I, I mean five x on a. We we could talk multiples. Yeah, later, yeah. but probably maybe a little yeah. high for the for the yeah, market. Yeah, five x for a million dollar landscaping company might be a little bit high. Okay, but okay. So let's say let's say it's four x. Let's say it's four x. It's four million dollars, right? I don't have you know. Let's say I, let's say I don't have four million. Let's say I'm someone at home. Yeah, I don't have four million dollars. It's just lying around to buy that business. So you're saying I can go to an SBA bank, and the bank would give me four million dollars to buy the business. So the so the bank wouldn't give you four million dollars. The bank would finance somewhere between I'd say like eighty to eighty five or up to ninety percent of the four million. So you as the buyer would have to put down what's called an equity injection or a down payment 
and that's going to be proportional to the purchase price of the business plus whatever else you need to finance along with the business. So cash to the balance sheet, working capital, closing costs, your buyer attorney and financial due diligence costs, the SBA guarantee fee, which is basically the SBA's equivalent more or less of private mortgage insurance. So basically the the winners pay for the losers with these SBA deals. But back to your question, um, 80 to 90% financing, somewhere in that neighborhood, probably more in the 80 to 85% range. Okay, so let's say that I can get 80%. So the bank, so I'm trying to buy this business for $4 million. The bank's going to give me 80%, which is $3.2 million yep. in my head. I think, yeah. So then I need $800,000. Now, what happens if I go to the seller, the owner, maybe an older seller, right? He's trying to retire. Yeah. He or she. Um, and what if I say, hey, I'm going to pay you $4 million. Um, I can pay you $3.2 million up front. And then I'd like to finance a seller note over five years for the remaining eight hundred thousand. Yes, would that, that work? Basically, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to solve for right. me not putting. Let's say I'm at home, I have no money, right? And I'm trying to buy a business, right. and become an acquisition entrepreneur. Yeah, is that a possibility? Yeah. So the the way to go about this, Nathan, would be you'd have the seller hold the seller's note for somewhere around half of that eight hundred thousand, and I would say you'd want to kind of shoot for a 10-year amortization on that 400000 so half of the 800000 And then with what's called a balloon payment or a bullet payment at the end of year four, year five. And what that means conceptually is whatever amount is left on the seller's note after year four, year five, you basically go back and you either pay that off with cash or you look to refinance the seller's note with the SBA bank or you refinance the SBA loan with that seller's note with a non-SBA bank, or now you can technically refinance it with another SBA bank. So then that last 400,000, let's assume that you know, you're know you maybe a Yale MBA, highly saddled with student loan debt or Harvard MBA or whatnot, and you have, um, I don't know, maybe $15,000 to your name. Or is, even if you're just like, a, what if you're just a corporate worker? What if you're just yeah, a corporate worker I mean, in Madison or in... Columbus, Ohio, or right, yeah, Columbus, yeah. Ohio. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, so maybe you're a corporate worker in Columbus, Ohio, and you have twenty thousand dollars in the bank. What you could do is that last four hundred thousand dollars, you could raise that as equity from family, friends, um, search fund investors, people on Twitter, their platforms. For example, one is called SMB Junction. There was a guy on Twitter that runs that. He's the admin. His name's Ben Tigler. So platforms like that, essentially, once you get a deal under LOI, there are investors in the space that will put equity into it in exchange for ownership in the business. With that being said, depending on how much cash you have, most investors along with the bank want to see that you as the buyer have some monetary and economic skin in the game so that you have some downside if things go sideways. So so you're saying basically... You can't just have the bank lend 80% and then 20% seller note. So you, you got to put at least 10%, yeah. either your own money, your family's money, or investors that are backing you to, to put into the deal. So you technically can. So you, you very much technically can. So the SBA used to have, when it came to the down payment, you either had to do 10% cash or you could split that 10% down the middle. And you could have half of the 10% be buyer group cash from you as the, the operator and or investors. And then the other half of it be the full standby seller's note, essentially a seller's note accruing interest for the full term of the SBA loan. And then once the SBA loan will be paid off, you could make payments on at that point in time. Don't get me going on the full standby. Um, but the, the new option essentially is that you as the buyer can either do the 10% cash down or you can use some combination of um, partial standby seller note. So a seller note that has no payments for the first two years, during which time it only accrues interest, and then payments start in year three and go through year 10, or the full standby seller's note, the one that I just described where there's no payments for the full term of the SBA loan. So with that being said, most banks still require that the buyer puts down half of the 10%, because they want to see economic skin in the game. It's very subjective, though, and there are some circumstances in which I've seen you know, management buyouts where maybe you're the GM in a company, and the bank looks at your experience more or less as sweat equity, 
So if the seller is willing to hold, let's say the bank is doing 80% financing, the seller has a note with payments, maybe that's amortized over 10 years with a balloon payment after the end of year four, and then the last 10% comes from a full standby seller's note, I've seen lots of banks open to that structure when it's a key man in the business or key woman um, that is buying the company because they know that business and they know that industry. So it reduces the risk substantially for the bank. That right. makes sense. So basically, someone coming into a new business, they've got to put some skin in the game. Or they're just really experts in that business. Maybe they're management of the business and they do a buyout. Yeah. If, if like you're that. a searcher like a first time buyer, um, or like a you know a searcher that isn't working the business, I would say expects to put at least five percent cash in, proportional to the purchase price plus everything else for the uses of funds. Which, to be honest, is actually pretty good if you think about it. Yeah, you only got to put down five percent to buy fairly sizable business with real cash flow. That's not bad. I wish I could do five percent down to give my HOA, Nathan. <laughs> 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 Agreed. Um, you shop for real estate. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, yeah, for, for, yeah real, real estate specifically. Yeah. Um, you know, just for going through it in my head, I would want to say, I mean, if let's say that I'm, I'm buying a business for $4 million, right? And um, you said $3.2 million in debt. You know what, what that payment would be like? The annual payments would be um, both principal and, and interest. Yeah, so I'm not the best at doing math in my head, to be honest with you. But, yeah. um, you know, let's just say the interest rate is prime plus 2.25%, which would currently be 10.75%. So amortize the 3.2 million out over 10 years, assuming that you're just buying the business with no commercial real estate at a 10.75% interest rate. And that's more or less, I don't know if you ought to check your calculator to see what that would be, but that's kind of more or less how you calculate the payment. Yeah, I think, so first of all, this is like a mortgage calculation. So this is something you can't really, you yeah. can't just multiply a 10.75% times the principal because there's also principal pay down. Right. But I, I think it would be somewhere around 500 to 550,000 a year. And the fact you can do that calculation, I can't, is why you have an MBA from Yale and I do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but my point is, is that, but my, my point is not to brag about math because I, I might be off. Someone can check yeah. that. But I think, I think I'm right. Um, I think it's somewhere around 550. My point is, is that that business has a million dollars of, of EBITDA or, or cash flow. You would have to look at the model. Yep. And so there's, you're, you're buying that business. There's a pretty good cash flow yield on it. And there's, there's some cash even above the debt payments, both principal and interest, that are happening. So if you can keep that business running at that cash flow level or even grow cash flow. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that would be, a, and honestly, on the spectrum of deals getting done in the search fund space, that would be a great debt service coverage number. I mean, you can run the numbers there, but it'd be somewhere in the high ones, I think. Yeah. I mean, a million over, let's say, 550, that's, yeah, near, it's like one point, whatever that is, 1.85, yeah. 1.9. You can do it. You can yeah. do the math. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, and then, and then that person could pull a salary, right? They could pull a salary. They could take distributions. Yep. Um, you know, someone that might be making a hundred thousand in a corporate role, if they can, of course, there's a lot of work. They got to learn new business. They yeah. got to make sure the business is performing. Can't be lazy. Can't be lazy. There's a lot of work. You might have someone taking a crap on your customer's uh, lawn. Yep. You have to deal with that. It, you know, you might have to show up with a trowel and be the one to scoop it out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so this is not easy work yeah. by any means, but I think the opportunity here, I'm just trying to paint the picture for people is that there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of excess cash flow here. Yep. In the business that can be used to grow the business, that can be used as salary, be used for lifestyle. And also after 10 years, and also I'm not including the seller note. There's a seller note here as well. So that would also take out cash flow. But at the end of 10 years, that business is fully paid off. And you own 100% of that business. Am I, am I saying that right? Hopefully, unless shit goes sideways and shit does go sideways. So Right. But, but you yeah. know, theoretically, there's a huge opportunity there because then you own 100% of that business, which is worth millions of dollars. Well, if we want to get technical here, you yeah. technically own 100% of the business at the time you buy it, right? But yeah, you own like less the debt because there would be debt on it. At that right. Time. You own it free and clear is what I was trying to say. Right. Unless you have investors, then you don't own 100%. That is correct. Right. So if you're raising the 400000 which is 5% to fund the down payment, right, then those investors are going to want a return. Right. Yep. 
Yeah. yeah. But hopefully the audience can kind of see there that this can be very lucrative. Yeah. Would you agree? Completely, 100%. Have you seen people go from like a corporate job or come out of MBA and, and do well on some of these deals? Yeah, I, uh, I, I've worked with all different types of people. Kev, from that background, there was a guy I worked with that went from, so not MBA, he worked in um, agricultural, kind of investment banking, grew up on like at a, at a farm in upstate New York, went to Cornell University, got a bachelor's degree there went into ag investment banking and then bought a commercial painting company. And now he's crushing it already looking at doing a subsequent add on acquisition. Um, works with a guy that was 25 or 26 years old, works at middle market investment bank in the Dallas area, works at Bain and company and bought an air duct cleaning business doing close to a million of EBITDA. This was towards the end of 2022 and he's crushing it from what I've heard. So you can do quite well if, if things go well. Have you seen a lot of things go bad? Um, I've had so I, I've had a circumstance with two different clients. One in which, just to kind of keep things anonymous here, um, person by business that was very heavily dependent on um, web driven traffic. It was a local service business, and the algorithm in Google essentially pivoted. And what happened was the business went from ranking kind of number two or number three when you'd search that specific service plus market name to being number eight or number 10. So he had to basically go in and really crank up the SEO engine to regenerate the amount of revenue that he was getting before in the months after he bought the business. And then I had a client that bought a business that was very contract dependent where one of the owners and the others of the contract decided that they didn't, you know, they, they want to kind of renegotiate terms and I, I, he lost out on like a $300,000 contract opportunity as a result. But I have not had any deals that have defaulted yet, as far as I'm aware. Fascinating. Um, so now let's, let's go back. We've, we've gone through some, I think, relatively basic examples that we got a little bit advanced towards the end of how powerful these SBA loans can be, how to structure them. Um, going back to your story, so you said you were you'd gone to Byline Bank. You started doing more M and A, small business finance, as well as real estate, right? Yep. And then and then kind of where were you at in your life and your career at that point? How were you thinking about things? Were you like, okay, I just want to continue to work until I'm a uh, a loan officer, doing my own deals for the bank? Yeah. Uh, do what? Were you trying to go to another bigger company? Kind of. What was your thought process there and, and where'd you go next? Yeah. Yeah. So I, so basically kind of worked in that closing role at Byline. Um, at that point in time, I was kind of trying to survey the landscape to figure out what type of opportunities could there be if I stay at the bank and either progress within the, the department or move to a different one. So there were kind of different points in time when I was contemplating, you know, moving to the front end lending spot at that bank or moving into underwriting. And long story short, Kev, after conversations with both my direct manager, my boss's boss, uh, the closing operations manager, I decided to stay in that role at that bank. But um, this may have be further along, so I don't want to fast forward too much here. I ended up leaving that bank uh, about three years after I'd started there, so April of 2021, to go to a different bank, Live Oak, to work in their middle market search fund lending division, basically to have more deal exposure to different types of opportunities, trying to go a bit up market, do something a bit differentiated from just working solely on SB deals in the kind of generalist uh, debt refinance to m a to ground up con new construction space. Interesting. So, so you you move to a bigger, I'm assuming it's a bigger bank. Obviously, I know what Live Oak bank is, but for yep. people that aren't aware, uh, they're the largest SBA lender, one of the largest yeah. in the United yeah, States. Yeah, lar largest by by dollar volume in, in the country. I think last year, don't quote me on this, um, they did around like 2 billion of, of deals, which, which is a lot. So, And they do SBA, they do searcher, yeah. uh, searcher, search fund, ETA deals, they do other deals, but they mainly focus on SBA. Yeah, so they, they do, yeah, mostly SBA. I know they do some USDA too, but yeah, lots of predominantly SBA deals, lots of volume, hundreds of millions. I don't know the exact number in the search fund lending space. 
they also have what's called verticals where they'll lend in like the veterinary space. Um, I think craft food and beverage wine businesses. Um, ch- chicken farms is another one as random as that I is. I think they have like a home restoration yeah. group as well. Yeah, home, or, re- home restoration, funeral yeah. homes, HVAC, and, and some of those other ones. So, Really? So that must have been really interesting for you because the team had gotten a lot bigger, I'm assuming. They do a lot more deals. Uh, there was a there were there were a lot of different people in different verticals. How was that for you? What were you doing at that point? Yeah, so so basically, Kev, when I went over there, it was to work in the um, the deals that were a bit up market from the SBA space. So to work on the specialty finance team. So at that point in time, the I think one of the first deals that I was working on was um, it was like a dental uh, DSO, like dental acquisition, like had private equity group buying a dental office. I think there were three different locations somewhere in the Southeast. And essentially that was one of the first deals I worked on. So in the conventional non SBA space. And so essentially I went from, you know, breathing down a fire hose and learning what SBA was for commercial real estate, my first job to breathing down that fire hose again, byline, learning all these different types of financing now, again, breathing down or, or drinking down the fire hose, learning these kind of middle market deals um, outside the SBA space. So when you say middle market, how big are these loan sizes? Because I, I know SBA loans are capped at $5 million. Yeah. So how big are these loans you're doing? I think this deal, I, I can't remember the exact particulars because it was almost two years ago now, but I think it was somewhere in like the low tens. So like the teens of millions. Right. And so you're, you've actually left the SBA department now, right? Because these loans, the bank's taking fully on their balance sheet. Correct. Right? Yep. Yep. And how did that change your, your approach or the bank's approach to, to deals and to risk? Yeah. So I, I was not really on the credit side. So as, as far as the particulars and like the calculation of the risk in, in that deal, I think a lot of it, it was kind of more based on the sponsor group, the experience there being a larger amount of equity going in, into that deal in comparison to SBA deals where it could be 5% or 10% cash. This was a lot lower percentage bank financing or LTV. And then also the fact that within the buyer group, they had a board of advisors that had been in the dental industry for a very long period of time. But um, yeah, so it was in that group at Live Oak and then transitioned from there, actually kept got kicked into the SBA generalist pond so similar to where I was when I was at Byline and went from one manager that was pretty hands off. Um, actually, one of the big reasons I went to Live Oak was to work for that manager because he was super chill as someone that was more of a micromanagement type. And long story short, that led me to go back to Byline early in the fall of 2021. Okay, so you went to Live Oak briefly. Yep, was there for five and a half, six months. And, and it wasn't your thing or you weren't enjoying it. Or... Yeah, it, it wasn't that I wasn't enjoying it, but it was uh, so it was a kind of a compilation of factors. So the bank is based in Wilmington, North Carolina, great city, really good food, just picture Wilmington. Uh, um, but it was it was a combination. So you moved to Wilmington with your wife? I did not. No, I. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, yes, yeah. My wife would would have killed me, Nathan. No, <laughs> yes, yeah, stayed in Madison, Wisconsin, in, in the suburbs of Madison, and um. So yeah, essentially went back for a couple of reasons. So one was, you know, you can't really replicate in person when it comes to banking, you know, just like the shooting the breeze, the 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 drinks, you know, getting to kind of hang out, socialize, and get the learning and collaboration and like just the small talk that happens within the office. You can't replicate that over Zoom, honestly. And essentially that was one thing. Another thing was I got a massive pay raise offered to me. So essentially I went from I the think byline missed you. But byline missed me. I went from seventy five thousand yeah. at the time I left to ninety five thousand to come back just to throw real dollars and cents out there. Yeah. For any people at byline watching this, feel welcome to use this to negotiate your next pay raise. <laughs> um so yeah, went from seventy five to ninety five thousand. And then also the other thing too was I just like the people. Like I'd you know, having worked in the same office as these people and getting to genuinely go through the trenches of the PPP loans and you kind of, you know... What's PPP loans? A payroll protection program. So during, yeah. the, during the pandemic, the disaster loans that basically mm. throwing the lifeline into the economy to save these businesses, you kind of felt like you'd gone to battle with these people, not to, you know, throw humor or anything at veterans or, or like that analogy... But I, there was something kind of about that in the collegial environment 
so that brought me back, um, along with the money, of course, right? To, to go <laughs> to go back to buy line from Live Oak. So, yeah, that's a that's actually a really interesting point or or story or an anecdote you raised. Like this was during COVID that you were at Byline, then you moved to Live Oak, you went back to Byline, and so yeah, how was that from a loan perspective, from a business perspective? How were these businesses doing? Any stories from that? Yeah, so um, so so basically, when I left to go to, and I'm trying to remember thinking back here to the whole pandemic and how that unraveled from a timing standpoint with the shutdown in various months and various years. But when I left, um, when I left Byline to go Live Oak, it was April of 21. And so it was kind of, I, th- I think at that point, PPP, Payroll Protection Program Round 2 had concluded. And there had been some businesses that had been giving, given deferred payments, I believe, if I remember correctly, for the SBA 7A loan when they bought the business. And so essentially lots of the banks were kind of going back more to lending as normal with the exception of like some of the restaurant businesses, trampoline parks, other industries that had been very much slammed by the pandemic. But um, other than that, it was, you know, kind of mostly lending as normal as I remember it. That's crazy. So some sectors got hit hard. Yeah, some sectors got hit hard. And the the ones that did, the banks just really pulled back. So like right now, you know, if you want to do a, a startup restaurant deal, non-franchise, of course, it's going to be a lot harder to get finance compared to, you know, 2018 or 2019. Just because of that, they have exposures already that are not doing well. Yeah, that and essentially the the banks are looking at, you know, the 1% scenario, we get another nat, like pandemic type situation. What's going to happen to this industry? And then based on the state and kind of the geopolitical environment, is it one that's likely going to shut down? Like the, the blue states or is it like a red state where it's, it might stay open, it might not, just situationally dependent? Really? So they even think about the political side of the state. And what choices that state will make in terms of lockdowns? The more sophisticated banks are. Wow, but, yeah. that is crazy. So, what I'm think what I, what I'm reading here is that they're taking what before was a black swan event, and they're saying they're putting that into their consciousness now and saying this could happen again. Correct. Yeah. When before they hadn't thought about even that happening. Yep. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. So so then from there essentially so this is so fast forward from. End of August and of September 2021, I go back to Byline. And essentially, some of the things that I've been told were going to change after I got back. So they actually had me sit down with a top management consulting firm. I don't know if I want to mention the name, but you recognize it. Does it, it. start with a Mick or? Um, it, it, it very well may. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, sat, sat down with a top management consulting firm. Does it rhyme with Lindsay? <laughs> You don't have to say. Kind of, yeah. You don't have to say. So, yeah. yeah, sat down with this time management consulting firm on a Zoom or Teams call, and I was basically asked as part of this study they were doing, what could they do to improve different things within the bank to make it better? For example, like the bank, they had us closer shipping around paper files from closings all across the country. So they'd go from the board to us, we'd organize them, we'd send them back to the uh, bank's loan operations department. And this had been one of the things that had burned me out when I left the bank initially. You're saying physical documents being mailed physical back. Physical documents. Physical and documents. what are these documents? Due diligence documents, legal documents, SBA loan. No, the, these would be like the closing package, like the right. note, the loan agreement, the settlement statement, things like that. And so like on the weekends, sometimes I'd be working and I'd be putting together all this paper and my wife would come into the office and be like, what are you doing? Like, let's go like for a walk and be like, I have all this paperwork bullshit I have to work through. (laughs) And so that had been one of the things I had been told was going to change and it it didn't, but there were some other things too. But essentially at the end of December, this is around Christmas time, I had a couple of days of vacation time. And that basically got more or less torpedoed by my boss's boss. So I had to deal, there was a ground up new construction. It was a like white box um, location for someone that was building a restaurant, if I remember correctly. We didn't have a construction contract. We didn't have approved plans. We didn't have all these different things. But she wanted to show best efforts to the bank's upper management that the deal, you know, the effort was being made to close me deals by the end of the year. So essentially, I got my vacation or my paid time off torpedoed to instead work to try to get this deal as far as it could get up towards the end of the year 
just to show we were putting in good faith efforts. So my wife was very pissed off about all of this because like we we're going to go skating that day and do all this stuff downtown and this and that. And I just realized, you know, at some point in time, I'm going to I want to have kids. I want to start a family. And the work life balance I was getting there was very subpar. So around the same time, I had a friend that was on the move. Actually, he was interviewing with a, a bank called First Business Bank. And I'd worked with them at Live Oak, Byline before that. And then I just missed him at First Bank Financial Center, a lender by the name of Bill Harrigan. So he's based in the greater Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. And so he reached out, he texted or called me, it may have been both. And he basically said, you know, hey, just wanted to check in to see how things have been going since you've been back here. I'm talking to this bank based in Madison called First Business Bank. They lend nationally in the SBA lending area. It seems like a good opportunity. Would you be interested in talking with them? And so I said, yes. He introduced me to the, um, I think it was first the national sales manager there named Marty Ferguson. And so I talked with him and then eventually the, you know, the gears kind of went from there and I went through the interview process and got hired there. I think this is back in early March of 2022. Oh, wow. So you were at Byline round two. Byline round two. For like six months, <laughs> six months. But then when they, when the year end vacation got canceled, your yeah. wife was like, you, you she's probably going to leave you maybe. And you're probably just like, I got to She change. wouldn't leave me. I mean, she was just like, fuck this. Like, you know why? Yeah, she's getting pissed. Right. She's getting yeah, mad. She, yeah, she wasn't, she wasn't happy. Un so unhappy you, wives are scary. <laughs> I, I'm not married, so I don't know. But right. I've heard, I've heard that. Yeah, it's a thing. So, and maybe, you know, maybe it was a good thing. So then, so she kind of helped you to start thinking, okay, maybe I should consider other uh, banks to work for. Correct. Yeah. And you so, found this opportunity. So that, I mean, that kind of microcosm or that, you know, one scenario, I just saw like, you know, right now the stakes are lower because I don't have kids. It's just me and my wife, albeit obviously marriage is very important. And I, I just thought. Shout out to uh, your wife. Shout out to my wife. <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought I can't have this happening when I have kids because I'm going to have bigger problems with bigger stakes. So. Okay. So then you, you've found this other bank and, and what happened there? Yeah. Because I know you're not working there now. And that was in 2022. I'm so, not. I, I checked so my, you've been bouncing around a lot. I checked my bank account this morning. I didn't get a paycheck from them. So, okay. <laughs> um, Life of the entrepreneur. Life of the entrepreneur. Yeah, no man. paycheck coming but in. But I, I did get a, a bigger paycheck from a deal I just closed. Oh, so, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When was that? How, how much was it? No, when, when, uh, when did the deal close? Oh, it was uh, two weeks ago. It was like $16,650. So. Oh, nice. Oh, so yeah. you, got the, you got the check today. You got the payment today. I got, well, people don't really send checks anymore these days, but yeah. I got the ACH today in my bank account. There you go. Nice. Okay. So we would have to go, uh, go, it's a Friday night in Atlanta, right? It's a Friday night. We, we, should, we should grab we should some drinks. Some drinks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so back to your question, Nathan, or, or do you go by Nate? Either or is good, but back to yeah. your, back to your question. So, so I started at this first business bank. I'll, I'll just call it FBB because it's shorter, and we only have two hours for the podcast. So I want to keep all the time <laughs> that we can. So I started FBB. Let's ask the production team. Maybe we can push this to two and a half. We'll see because you got we got a lot to cover. So, That's I, all so good. I started FBB in March of 2022, <laughs> and the day that I start there, so th this is like, you know, great bank, great culture, like show to FBB, you know, phenomenal opportunity I had there. They let you take vacation. They, I'm they let me take vacation. Some places don't. <laughs> Some places are like slave shops yeah. or sweatshops, right? Um, so yeah. By the way, I just have to share real quick that that experience has happened, you know, in my life and with, with a lot of other people I know in the corporate world. And, and I think that's something that is so frustrating about the nine to five. And I think since COVID and the remote work and, and Gen Z's, I've heard, because I left corporate 2017, but I've heard that it's gotten a little bit better. But still, I think that that's one of the draws of becoming an entrepreneur. That's one of the draws of breaking the formula, as I call it, of not being in that formula, right? Not being like, oh, boss, can I take a week off to go to Hawaii with right. my wife or my husband? Right. Yeah. I mean, and uh, because that's frustrating. Yeah. When you're working so hard right. all year, and then at year end, your boss or your manager is like, "Oh yeah, you got to work all weekend and, yeah. and take your vacation too." And and that's on the loan docs, that's right? one of the tough things too. And and we'll get back to your question in a minute. Yeah. Um, about working as a W two, especially in banking, 
is there's so much emphasis placed on the end of the year, especially when you work for a publicly traded company with a year and calendar, is that you know whatever goal hasn't been absorbed or materialized leading up to that point in time now is kind of crunch time. So if you've seen the you know the movie Ben Hur, like Row and You Shall Live, and it's like you're on a ship turning the oars, right? And essentially, with the year end being the time that it's either make it or break it, it's very hard to take vacation unless you put it in early. But even when you do, if you're someone that kind of comes across as like a company man or a company woman, you can almost get taken advantage of in many ways where you get pulled back in and it's like, hey, come back to the office or like, hey, can you help with this? And if you aren't good at saying no and if you don't set boundaries, you can get taken advantage of. And then on the flip side, even if you're good at saying no, it can be hard to get ahead because you're, you know, you're not as receptive and viewed as much as a team. As much player. as you are, for example. So some of those colleagues, they weren't maybe they, you know, they were like, oh shoot, Matthias is doing that. So I gotta do it too. Yeah. And, and probably likewise. It's probably a, a competition element. And, and the good ones are there and the bad ones get fired. I mean, it, it's <laughs> it's the same with any sort of company, yeah. right? So yeah, and I think, you know, it comes down to these these cultures that can emerge in these corporate environments. And and you talk, you mentioned there also being the cutthroatness of some of the culture, right? Where people, they want to take vacation, but then they see that, oh, that person's not, they're working holidays. Right. So I got to do it too, because I'm trying to get that promotion. Yeah. Or I'm trying to get that bonus. And the, the tough part too, as well, Nathan, especially when it comes to working on deals, whether it be in closing SB lending or in the underwriting side, is when you take vacation essentially whoever your backup is has to familiarize themselves with the deal and step into getting up to speed. And there could be communications that got missed by the person backing you up due to not being copied on emails or not having important piece of background information. And so there can be this time delay gap that comes into play to basically get the deal back to where it needs to be to be on the tracks. 100%. So you... But going back to, I guess, the, the last bank. I think this is the last bank you were at, FBB. Yep. So how yeah. was that for you? So yeah, so going back to the last bank. So, you know, I, I interviewed there, had a good experience, got hired. Did you get another pay raise? I did not. I actually, yeah, took, glad to openly share about this. Took a step back, $7,000, going from 95000 to 88000 with part of the rational being that, I believe, if I remember correctly, the 401k was better. The vacation time was somewhat longer, so those were compensating factors. But the healthcare was in market versus out of market. So my former bank had been Blue Cross, Blue Shield. I think the the bank I switched to, I can't remember the exact provider, but they had more kind of local clinics, so just easier to to get um to get a provider easily accessible. But part of it was the work-life balance. And I was kind of weighing that $7,000 as, am I going to have better work-life balance? And at the surface, when I interviewed, it felt like I would. And if you think about it on a monthly basis after tax, what is that? De minimis. Honestly. Yeah, de minimis compared to the quality of life benefit of taking your wife on vacation and having weekends to go hang out with Correct. your wife and your family, right? And now being, in, you know, being an entrepreneur, it's, I mean, my wife works, right? Shows the wife. But you can you can go on vacation more when you want to, right? And you don't have to ask her permission or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, even on my side, I've gotten accustomed to, like you mentioned, had the year end grind. Yeah, close out the year. Yep. I don't know, man. For me, like mid December to mid end of Jan, I'm I'm in Costa Rica. Nice. That's what I do usually every year. Costa Rica is a blast. I've gone twice. I I plan yeah. to go again sometime. Yeah, we should we should go sometime. So yeah, I've I can't. I don't know if I can go back to that, you know, yeah. grinding it out at your end. Yep. I, I'm in Costa Rica. I'll, I'll be online, but I'm not going to be shuffling documents and trying to close deals. Um, We're training UPS documents. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, don't, I definitely don't want to be at the office. Can't, can't blame you, man. <laughs> but yeah, so back to, uh, back to FBB or First Business Bank. So started there in March of 2022. And the day that I joined, so you know on LinkedIn how it notifies people in your network when you get a new job. I got message from an attorney that I used to work with at Byline and Live Oak Bank named Scott Oliver. Uh, Scott's based at a law firm called Lewis and Capus, based out of Indianapolis. And so he reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, you know, hey, Matthias, congrats on the new job. Wish you all the best of luck and success. 
A, by the way, here's a space on Twitter of all these business buyers looking to buy small to medium sized businesses. You should join this space. You should start networking with these folks, putting out content on business plans, projections, things of that nature to help your bank generate deals. So I basically started just networking on Twitter, pumping out content, following people that were active in the space like Eric Pasifici at SMB Law Group, Connor Bean at Scalable CFO, phenomenal fractional CFO for anyone looking for one, and others. And over the two months that I was at my bank from March through May of 2022, I sent them the equivalent of $15 million of referrals, not all of which made it into underwriting. One five or five zero? What, one five. Still, that's okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And essentially what happened, just to kind of give the truncated version here and feel welcome to ask more as you, you want, is in April, I made the mistake of retweeting a tweet from my bank, at which point my bank's head of marketing that ran the bank's Twitter account, hot one of my banks or my, my Twitter, started going through my feed, looking at my posts, for example, me explaining to people how to use a home equity line of credit to keep their house below the threshold at which the SBA requires it to be pledged and posts adjacent and related to that one. So she then pulled in the bank's head of compliance that ran the bank's compliance mm -hmm. department, and they kind of talked to each other, and then they collectively reached out to me, and they were like, hey, what are you trying to do here with this Twitter, whatnot? And essentially, from a, you know, from a micro standpoint, they wanted to control it. And I'm and not- This is your personal Twitter. This is my, this is my personal Twitter. So this is Matthias Smith Twitter. Or my, your... my Twitter handle is at SBA, like Sam Bravo Alpha underscore Matthias. But okay, yeah, my, SBA my, Matthias. Yeah, You're at, the SBA guy. SB, um, I guess I'm the SBA guy. There's like, <laughs> I think there's actually a guy with the Twitter handle at SBA guy, but yeah. I would like to think I'm the SBA guy. No offense to anyone else. You, you took his place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so essentially they, you know, they want to control it. And I was just like, fuck, no, like this is ridiculous. So, and this was April 2022 or April? Yeah, April of, 2022. So halfway, it was either. So you've been there for like a couple months. No, I'd started in March. I was only like four weeks in. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you brought 15 million of deal flow yeah, through the Twitter. Potential deal flow. So potential like, deal flow. Yeah, so like deals that were pre-LOI, various places, things of that nature. So you were seeing it was actually creating business already within four weeks. Yeah. And the bank's like, no, 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 yeah. compliance, law. And, and one of the reasons I did this too was one of the first department calls I was on at my bank, the managing director of the bank, Marty Ferguson, basically said something to the effect of, we have a shortage of deals. Like, we need fucking deals. So You're I, trying to help them. So I, I took this almost as like a battle cry, right? I think like Braveheart <laughs> where you have Mel Gibson like yeah. running up and down with the horse. And so I thought, why not kind of, why not try to help the team, essentially, more or less? But they didn't seem to appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially they reined in. I kind of ignored them. <laughs> and so just kept doing my own thing on Twitter for the next four weeks. So I got to my two-month review in early May, right before going on this vacation to Greece with my wife, which I'll get to. And I got told by my boss, like, you know, hey, you're kicking butt at your job. Keep it up. Everyone loves working with you. But we either need you off of Twitter or we, we need you to stop posting about banking, SBA, and acquisitions unless you want to vet your stuff by us first because there's a concern from upper management that if someone's deal goes sideways, it's going to come back and cause problems for the bank since you work here. So shortly after this, and Alan, if you want to jump in and ask questions first. Yeah, I mean, what do you mean by the deal going sideways? So you're saying if you bring in a deal that goes sideways or so the like, fact that you're making claims that people might rely on? The, the, the latter, the, yeah, right. the, the second one. So basically, like if, you know, say someone tried to go get a HELOC and they're like, hey, I'm not going to have to pledge my house. And they go to first business bank or a different lender. And then maybe the lender takes the land their house and they're like, oh, this guy, Matthias on Twitter told me this. And they reach out to F First Business Bank and they say, like, your guy told me to do this and it didn't work. Like something right. like that, basically. And they sue you or something right. like that. Right. Well, it'd be the bank's problem. Right. They, they could try to sue me if they want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably call them out. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So you, so you had that. So you had this review. You're probably kind of annoyed. Yeah. Because you seem to love the Twitter. Yeah, so I had the review, and leading up to the review, Nathan, I had my boss and my head of um, my boss, my head of marketing, and my head of compliance hitting my Twitter account, like or not my Twitter account, my LinkedIn account, every two days. 
because I had LinkedIn premium so you can see who's in your LinkedIn. So I basically was like shitting myself like, hey, I'm going to fucking get fired here. Like I, that was they're viewing your profile every like two days. Every two days, right? You're seeing like, them. They're they're lurking. They're, yeah, they're watching like they're, what you're posting. Like, I felt like the hawk over my shoulder. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and so so right after this two month review, um, I had a trip plan to go to Greece with my wife for two weeks, and so I naturally just due to having this vacation plan, I did not want to rock the boat right before going on vacation. So I was very kind of non confrontational at this point in time. But I just realized getting up to that point, you know, like this is just ridiculous. I feel like I'm basically in a chamber with the oxygen being sucked out of it. I have like where people do capital punishments almost, not to be kept brutal here. Yeah. And so right after this uh, two month review and being on this trip in Greece, I thought to myself, you know, here I am helping my bank generate all this deal flow and educate the space, which honestly reflects good on the bank, if anything. And I just felt like it wasn't being appreciated. And I thought, you know, here's this market and this, um, all these searchers on Twitter looking to buy these small and medium-sized businesses. I'd seen folks on Twitter, like the SMB Law Group guys, that had basically started businesses using Twitter as a foundation for their, for their business platform, among with other social media channels like LinkedIn and similar. And so I thought, you know, here's a market of all these business buyers looking to buy small to medium-sized businesses on Twitter. I'd made good connections in the, in the space on Twitter that I gen, gen, genuinely did not want to lose. And I thought, if I stay at my bank, I'm going to have to eject myself from this platform on Twitter, which I just could not get myself to do. So I thought, you know, there has to be a way to go about starting a business where I can harness this market in this ecosystem of the small to medium sized business ETA Twitter. So then I thought adjacent or kind of second order to that, I'd worked at these four different banks, the first bank financial center, the Live Oak, the Byline, and the first business bank. And I felt like I had a pretty good understanding genuinely or generally speaking of what different types of deals these different banks wanted to fund based on the background of the buyer. You know, are they an operator person? Are they a recent MBA graduate like yourself, have they worked in the industry, searcher. Um, the the debt service coverage was a 1.15 DSCR deal, 1.25, 1.3, 1.5 or higher. All these different banks have their own spot where they want to be. The industry, anything from landscaping to you know an e-commerce business or someone selling vaginal tightening products to the, the composition of the down payment was an all cash down payment or some combination of the full standby in cash. And then also the percentage of the SBA financing relative to the purchase price. So I felt like I had a pretty good lay of the land from the general. You knew like a lot of the drivers that they yeah. used to evaluate yeah, different basically deals. There's a lot of moving parts that can happen in a deal. Yeah, a lot of different I, factors. I felt like I had a pretty general good understanding of the different levers. I had not worked in credit, I admit, but like I felt like I'd seen enough deals. I kind of knew, you know, this is a byline deal. This is a live oak deal. This is an FBB deal, et cetera. Um, albeit I only think worked on like three deals at FBB, so I didn't have as many data points there. But then as the lenders that I'd worked with had left the banks that I'd been at to go to different banks, the ones that were douchebags I'd stayed in touch with over time to keep tabs on what they were getting done at their banks. And then I'd also follow their LinkedIn posts too. And then lastly, in this SBA space, when I'd been at Live Oak, when I'd been at Byline, these other banks, it felt like anywhere from three quarters to 80% of deals were coming from loan consultants or loan brokers, pick what you want to call it, to the bank where essentially they were introducing the deals to the bank and helping the client go from getting the term sheet or the financing proposal to going into underwriting, going into post-approval, closing all the way through the process and getting paid by the bank at the end of the process anywhere between one to 2% of the loan amount. So I and thought- And you were seeing that, you knew yeah. you, from inside the bank, you were able to see the check going to the- Correct. The loan yeah, because well, I so was seeing how much money they were making. Yeah, so of. I wouldn't see the actual check going because I was in the accounts payable division. But like on the credit write up, it would say like so and so's name, like X percentage, because then you as a closer would send them the SBA form that they'd have to sign called the SBA fee disclosure compensation agreement form, where the borrower acknowledges that the bank is paying them. So essentially, Kevlar's in Greece. I thought, you know, like fuck it, you know, here's this market on Twitter with these business buyers. Here's this revenue model. And here's my knowledge of the space. 
why not take a flyer at myself and see if I can do this and harness Twitter to help, you know, these searchers and or mid-career professionals go through the financing process, kind of using both that knowledge and the knowledge from working and closing after the deal got approved. And another thing too, Nathan, is one observation I'd had just from working in the space in the closing department is lots of these loan consultants were doing all these different types of deals from SBA to residential multifamily development, and they weren't really focused specifically on ETA. And lots of them, their professional experience, if you looked at their websites or LinkedIn, had just been on the front end origination sales side and not even in credit or the post-approval closing side. So they knew you know, how to get the deal in the door, but they weren't specialized and they also weren't privy to what actually goes on after the deal is approved. So I felt like I was able to kind of, one, hone down that specialization part and two, bring the post-approval knowledge to the table. So you had more knowledge and potential advisory capacity for getting a deal done. Correct, yeah. Than even some of the people that might be even at the banks. Yep. In the, in the, what's it called? The, the front office? The people that are trying to bring in deals? Yeah, the, the, the lenders, business development officers. Some banks call them lenders. Others call them BDOs. And so you're in Greece at this point. So you finally got your, your vacation because yeah. you canceled your vacation yeah. for the previous company. Yeah. And it sounds beautiful. Where were you in Greece? Yeah. So we so me and my wife went to it was San, um Athens, Santorini. So we flew to Athens from Chicago, then flew from Santorini, or sorry, Athens to Santorini, ferry from Santorini to Crete, and then flight from Crete back to Athens. So I was actually on the island of Crete at the time I, I put my nose in. So it was right before going on a day trip um, to, I think it was like Zeus's cave and like up the mountains, riding like a mule pretty down Pretty epic, the hill. pretty legendary. Th- this, is a, this is a legendary day, man. So took a hot shower, I was just thinking in the shower, like, is this the day? Because I've been thinking about this up to this point, like I, I can't come back and work at this bank. Like this, the environment was just literally crushing my soul not to be, not to exaggerate here. And so I thought, when's the time to do this? I just and it was mainly the Twitter aspect. It was you didn't want to give up the social media. I didn't presence. want to give it up. Yeah, like I, you I love just, it. Yeah, I, I loved it. I love the people. I just saw the the potential and like the growth in the space. So before kind of going further, like in the two months I've been on Twitter, I just seen the amount of volume in the space exploding with the people that were coming onto the platform. Right. So I was. Within the entrepreneurship through acquisition space. Within the ETA space. Both people that want to be service providers and searchers too. And so I was in Crete and it was the morning before I was going to go on this full day trip with my wife. And I just sent this email off that I had drafted in my on my laptop. And I basically just said like, hey, I quit. Here are my reasons, short and sweet. I'll bring my laptop back when I get back. Wow. Had you spoken to your wife about this during the trip or not? So she, so she knew it was coming. She didn't know when it was going to come. Right? It's kind of like when you're, <laughs> it's kind of like when you're in an execution chamber and you're like waiting for someone to like shoot the gun. Right? Not to be brutal here, or but but anyways, she knew it was coming. You love and, a gun and war analogies. I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. So she she knew that this was coming, but she didn't know when it was going to come. And basically, I I told her after we got in the van to start going this day trip. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> how was she feeling? Like, obviously, she's probably overjoyed to be on vacation in beautiful Greek islands. Yeah. But, but how was she feeling thinking of coming back home without a paycheck? Well, she was coming back to a paycheck. I, right. I was not. She was working, which is good. Right. Okay. Yeah. How was she feeling about that? Yeah. So I, I had very good liquid savings. I mean, it was in the, the six figures at that point in time between retirement and cash. But um, I mean, basically, she was worried. I'll admit that she was kind of shitting herself, as was I. <laughs> but she also believed like everything would be fine because right. she just knew that I was someone that got things done. So that is an epic story. Yeah. Now here we are in Atlanta. I really years later. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's been what two? It's been a year. How far are we? A year and ten months. So this was it was May. Wow, not even two years yet. May, not even a year and ten months. So right now it's March eighth. Looking at my watch here. So this yeah. was, um, this was May fifteenth, twenty twenty two. So next Friday will actually be a year and ten months. 
and two months from next Friday will be two years. Not that wow. Old. That is crazy. I think that, so what I found at least, you know, with this podcast and talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, content creators, et cetera, that left their day job to do something kind of crazy, to do something, start their own thing. There's, there's something that always sparks that break the formula BTF moment, in my experience. And so it's really interesting to hear your story because it seems like it was really tied to the social media, you seeing that massive opportunity with Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera, and then kind of feeling constrained and saying, screw this, I'm going to leave. Yeah. And, and basically, Kev, I, I thought, you know, the downside from leaving my job was obviously not having a paycheck. But I viewed that downside as less than the downside of um, staying at my bank. Because I just saw the upshot, like the moonshot, metaphorically speaking, of going out and doing this relative to staying at the bank. And it's like, what, am I going to go from 88 to 98? And like, you go up like 10,000 a year or whatever. And then all of a sudden you're like 16, you have gray hair. And it's like, why did I do this for the last 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> like, what am I doing here? <laughs> so true. Yeah. I remember going through similar thoughts when I was uh, working in banking as well. So on the finance side of things. And, and you can make like, I mean, I mean you're an investor investment maker right like yeah like your upside would have been higher than mine assuming that you're on like what the sales business development side and bringing in the deals i mean i know investment bankers more in the management side at these bigger banks can make in the tens of millions of dollars i think in the sba side very few very if you're if you're a global head yeah yeah you know yeah yeah very yeah. few but like you make it to the top of, right if, yeah. you, if you're a big dog or, or in yeah. PE. but um but in the sba space i mean single million digits like maybe two like max probably if you're like really freaking cranking it and there are people that i know that are making over a million dollars a year at, as lenders but, but essentially you know I, I kind of saw the upside monetarily and not just monetarily but just from like a, a passion enjoyment and like sense of fulfillment side would be higher than staying at my bank it's like you're you're losing the 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 loss of that paycheck, um, or, or better said, going back to that paycheck doesn't compensate for the missed upside. Right. Like, like in, I mean, the missed full, opportunity of not doing right. this, what you're doing now. But like in full disclosure, I mean, like 88,000 was that last salary. Like, I'll make that and like one of the next deals I have closing. There you go. So it's like, but, but at that point in time, I mean, it, it felt like a huge leap, right? Like, I remember. I mean, there are moments in, in the early innings of, of what I'm doing where I'd like wake up at two in the morning. I'm like, fuck, I have one deal going on now. And it was not, not that you asked this question, but from the time I left banking in the middle of May of 2022 to closing my first deal is almost four months. Wow. And it was 10, I think it was like $10,500 somewhere in that neighborhood that I made closing the first deal. So if you average that over the four months, it's like I was making 2,500 bucks a month. <laughs> but, but then like after that, the flywheel really kind of started going. So it's all, you know, do you have the conviction in the business model, take a shot at it and hope it works. And I kind of viewed my fallback as hoping that I still seem somewhat employable to go back into SBA. I feel like I probably was maybe two years ago, but now probably feel less employable. <laughs> <laughs> they won't take you back now. Probably not. Not not that big. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, let's delve into that. Those those initial moments of breaking the formula or leaving your corporate job in May of of a year and a year and ten months ago. Like, yeah, what. What was that like? Like, you went from a situation where you were working a lot, like at your previous job before the, the FBB, you know, you're working even like holidays and things like that. You had a lot of structure. You mentioned you had um, a lot of camaraderie with your team. Yep. Right? And then kind of going from that to coming back from Greece, probably have a high, you know, you were in Crete. You were probably like super courageous and bold and thinking, yeah, F you guys, right? But then right. you go back to your apartment or your house yeah. in, in Wisconsin. 
it's like it's like really real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then what like, happened? Yeah, like where you just kind of yeah, at so, home, just yeah. I, I guess literally, it's okay. The moment by moment, right? So I get back, I land like you know, wheels down Chicago, like fuck, I need to make this work. <laughs> but so after I got back, um, I, I posted about this on LinkedIn, Twitter. And I actually put a clear copy of the check. You know, I was asked to return my laptop and they want my signing bonus back, which I think was like $3,200. So nothing significant, but it's like, you know, the gut wrenching yeah. or like just the the feeling of like giving back money you've been paid. It's weird, right? It's like, you know. You just spent 10 grand in Greece or whatever it was. And you're like, shoot. I was kind of. It wasn't that <laughs> yeah, much. I was, yeah. I was more frugal then. Okay. But, but anyways, yeah. like. You, but still, you know, you had a nice vacation. You spent right. some money and you're like, oh, I got to give back some of this money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like that, that kind of sucked. But yeah, essentially it's like you get, you get back. And I think it was shortly after I started or announced I was leaving Greece. That I ordered my business laptop and like had my website going and things like that. So a lot of the first days and weeks and whatnot was kind of getting the systems into place, you know, trying to get like some of the social branding going for my new firm, trying to initially build relationships in the lending space, working on getting these bank referral agreements in place, trying to get people to take me seriously, which is not always easy, <laughs> especially starting out. And yeah, it was a it was a lot of work, man. So yeah, that's that's definitely entrepreneurship for you. Yeah. Because how old were you at the time? I had just turned 29. You weren't even 30 yet. I was not even 30. I, like, I turned 29 in Greece, actually. Like wow. four days. Yeah, five days before I quit my job. I was on a... I remember this wall. I was uh, I was on a catamaran. It was in Santorini. So my, my wife, for whatever it's worth, my wife lost her phone that day in the ocean in Greece. That was your birthday? On my birthday, yeah. I had to overnight her phone. <laughs> <laughs> that but, is wild. Yeah. So you started building up this business. And what was your what was your day-to-day -day experience like at that time? Because you come back to cold Wisconsin. Yeah. Or so, guess, it was just May. This was May, actually. So it was like Yeah, so this was May, so like not came, too bad. Early late spring. So I, I yeah. came back. Um, so getting the website going, um, reaching out to people that I'd been DMing with on Twitter. After I'd put the announcement on Twitter that we kind of had some deals going to try to get some critical traction, um, putting videos out, putting content out. You had the name already figured out or you kind of figured that out during that period or? Oh, oh the business name? Yeah. Yeah. So the business name I figured out in Greece. Um, interestingly enough, the first business name, which I'm glad I didn't go with, was Unconstrained Capital. <laughs> 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 and basically the... <laughs> The, the thought process behind it was like, you know, like unconstrained on social media. Like that's a thing. My wife was like, you can't fucking use that name. Like that, that sounds so dumb. <laughs> it's pretty accurate probably. Yeah. You see, you know, you do have a reputation in the industry right. for being pretty unhinged. Right. You know, some people may well, say. Well, she's like, it sounds like you're like taking a shit or something like that. So I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to go with that name. And I was thinking back to, you know, what other names could be good. And I thought, you know, like what is, um, what's a word that kind of has the connotation of trying to be at the forefront of like a new way of doing things. And so I thought, you know, there are a couple different words. Pioneer was one of them. And I thought capital went well with like SBA debt. Advisory kind of went well with advising on commercial loans. So that that was how the name came about. But there are some different ones that I was let's playing show, with. Let's turn a little bit to the camera. Let's show the audience what, what they're dealing with here. Let's, yeah, let's on your shirt. Oh, the, looks like, yeah, the, you put that logo best. together, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Yeah, so I did not. Pioneer Capital Advisory LLC, yeah. PCA. Yeah, so I actually did not design the logo. It was uh, And you had to get the classic uh, Patagonia-style vest going, too, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Th this is actually a North Face vest. Shout out. Shout but. out to North Face. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to get the, the classic finance uh, vest going as well. That's, yeah, I wanted to that. feel like a VC walking around <laughs> these business schools. <laughs> <laughs> have have like an air of credibility. Yeah. <laughs> I need a, a Trivolta Investments. Uh, you should best. I don't have one right now. But we'll why, see. Why not? I don't know yet. I'm not. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I got to get to your level. Yeah, you close the deal first. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, you help me. I'm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good to that, dude. So that's wild. So you built this firm from the ground up. Yeah, from the ground up. Close yeah. your first deal four months in. Yep. 
Yeah, so the, the first year in six and a half months, I think it was like $14 million of SB loans I got done. To put that in perspective, like most lenders, so obviously I'm a commercial loan broker, not a lender. Most average lenders that keep their jobs are doing about a million a month. So if you annualize that, that would be like 28 million annualized. Last year I did 65 million my first full calendar Sorry, year. Sorry, a million a month? Yeah, of lending volume. A million or? a month in lending volume is like average. So that's 12 million a year? 12 million a year. Okay. So I, I did 14 in six and a half months with the first two months really just being pounding the pavement, getting my name out there, establishing the brand, things like that. Last year I did 65 million in 12 months, um, of which like a week I spent in Ireland just tooling around <laughs> with my buddies for St. Patrick's Day. Um, and then this year I'm gunning for knock on wood 100 million. Wow. But by Q3, I'd like to do that. I don't know if it's possible, but if there's a will, there's a way. So Wow. That's great. So it's gone okay for you? Yeah, it's gone all right. <laughs> I did more deals last year than my former employer did the year that I left. Wow. Yeah. How do, how do your old colleagues and I, I like to give them shit every time. Do you still see them? Yeah, well, yeah. Like I, I see some of the lenders of the you know the networking functions and like we're we're cool. I yeah. haven't done any deals with them. I mean that's kind of a longer story. They have a conservative bank for like council that they use that has a reputation of torpedoing deals in the SBA market. So I won't go into too much detail there. But yeah, I'm still friendly. Like if I see them, I'll say hello. I've had drinks with them before. So good people. Wow. So when you're actually getting these deals, did it end up being Twitter and LinkedIn? Is that is that a large part of your deal flow? Yeah. So about so back when I started, it was a hundred percent my deal flow just direct off of Twitter, right? So you know, for example, you Nathan, I can't remember how we connected. Maybe it was email or through uh, someone in your MBA program. But a lot of people, it's you know, Wolf of Main Street Searcher, whatnot, will DM me on Twitter. Hey, I'm working on an HVAC deal in Savannah, Georgia. It's about to go under LOI for 2.8 million, and this is the structure. Blah blah blah. Can you help me get this finance? So, like that initially was 100 percent of the deal flow, direct from Twitter. Then I had some kind of stragglers that would come in from Search Funder, some from LinkedIn, and then over time, as I'd close deals, people that would have their friend also searching would send their friend to me when things went well. And then from there, I've gotten stuff from other service providers like m and attorneys, accountants. Um, my wealth manager sent me a few leads and just different people in the space. And now I'll just get people that will find me from my website or find me from Google. So I, I think now I'm down to 75% direct off of Twitter, which I'm trying to get down. I want to be at- Wow, but it's still, still 75%. Yeah, still 75%. I, my goal is to be at 50 by the end of the year. It's so like right now I'm sponsoring two minor league sports teams in Madison. Wow. A minor league baseball team, minor league soccer team. I'm redoing my whole website. I'm going to be flying to clients I've closed deals with with a professional videographer to do like high quality content, kind of like this. Um, albeit not necessarily a studio setting for more kind of content, just for marketing and things like that. That's incredible that it's still 75% through Twitter. Like that shows you were right. The model Twitter, is very powerful. Twitter is amazing, man. And the, the crazy thing, and this is probably maybe a longer discussion on social media and ETA. Oh, let's go into it. Is I think I kind of grabbed the bird or like, I don't know if that's the freaking analogy here, like at the right point in time, because... Twitter at the point in time that I really kind of got active on it, the algorithm very much favored threads, kind of the longer form posts on, I have a couple on like business plans. I think one that has like a thousand likes, more likes than the one about the person shitting in the front yard. <laughs> and some, some other kind of longer posts on like full standby, partial standby, projections, things like that. Those posts used to get tons of engagement. And in the last year, so like from early 2023 onward, I've found that those longer form posts get less engagement. And now what's getting a ton of engagement is what I call the shock and awe post. So for example, if you ever see me posting a tweet about like a target my wife shot at, <laughs> you know, like with like home defense or the gun range or things like that, my thesis there for posting that isn't solely just to stir the pot, which I do like to do, <laughs> but it's more that, it performs better on the platform because that's what things have pivoted to. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I've noticed that too. I've been in the game a little bit later and I don't do Twitter or X.com at all. But I started this year with a challenge of doing a LinkedIn post every weekday. Yeah. And I've stuck with it except for one day I missed it. Why do you miss it? I, I can't remember. I think I was traveling or something. I don't know, some excuse. Neither I, ran, I had a mental writer's block or something. Need to work harder. I do, I do. <laughs> but I've noticed, so first of all, I mean, I've, I have much less followers than you on LinkedIn. I think I have like, well, on LinkedIn, I might have a little bit more than you actually, but I know you focus on Twitter, but I have 5,500 or something like that yeah. followers that, that has come through just posting every day. And I've noticed that too, is like the, the longer posts, they're not doing as well as like the shorter kind of yeah. pithy posts for, for whatever reason, maybe because there's so much content nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. So b- back to the prior point, Kev, to where yeah. I was trying to get at, is I think I basically got into this space at the right time with the combination of how that Twitter algorithm was prioritizing content. Whereas had I served my business a year later, you know, I, I think it would have worked from a thesis standpoint, but with the initial content I was posting that was getting critical engagement, specifically the longer form threads, last year relative to, you know, mid-2022, they didn't perform it as high of a level. So I, I think there you was... timed it well. Yeah, I think I timed it well, which honestly was just luck. And do you think the acquisition by Elon Musk kind of changed some of the algorithms? So you kind of started before the acquisition closed? It could be. It 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 could be. Speaking of acquisition finance, yeah. it, shout out to uh, shout out to Elon. <laughs> shout out to Elon. And is it is it JP Morgan that did the the, the acquisition loan? I can't remember. Not if it was sure. Morgan it was Stanley you, or JP yeah. Morgan or so it's a consortium at least. But yeah, I, I, don't know, I, anyhow, I think that's that, a big deal. I think yeah. that was like a twelve billion dollar debt facility. Yeah, or something. I I think they could just be toggling different things to see like what works and like you, yeah. you never know, right? Like that people want to mix things up. I, yeah, Elon does for sure, right? But yeah. <laughs> All different conversation. <laughs> that is uh, is crazy. So, what's your approach to to Twitter? Yeah. So my do you have a challenge? Do you post every day? Post every week? Is it just kind of it comes to you? Yeah. So how do my, you think about your content? So I have no content calendar at all. Like there are some people that like swear by the content calendar and they do all this scheduled stuff. I just post shit as it comes to mind. So <laughs> my philosophy to Twitter is like Twitter is basically right like a big echo chamber big kind of you know audience of people that are out there to absorb different knowledge from SMB to real estate to all these different topics and essentially what I try to do is some post educational right like stuff on um, the home equity line to keep your house out the SBA loan deal structuring as like what percentage is normal to come from the SBA loan seller note down payment um, what is a full standby or partial standby note, walking through the mechanics of that, what should go into a business plan projection. But then other than that, I try to sprinkle in some personal stuff just to like make myself seem like a human. So for example, I mean, there are lots of people that aren't humans on Twitter, honestly. <laughs> That's a whole different discussion. So like last weekend, for example, I was enjoying some beers with my wife after golfing with her. And then like I took a picture of her with the beer and it's like, you know, this is why, this is my why for being an SMB owner, things like that. Um, or like, I think I posted a picture of my dad one time. But then the third pot is the shock and awe, right? Because that's what performs. So whether it be like shotgun shells or home defense or like gun stuff or, uh, I don't know, things on like the border, like just things that drum up general engagement to spur criti- critical thinking. So some, some controversy. Yeah, some controversy. And in my thesis, on that specifically, as I've, you know, I, I won't go down to too far down this rabbit hole, but just for the purposes of giving some transparency for anyone that wonders why I post that stuff. The reason I do is one observation I've had over the, the last, you know, year, nine months and two weeks or year and 10 months has been that most of these buyers tend to be guys on average. Not that that's who I think should be the long term buyer in ETA, but it's just who it is. They tend to be mid 20s to mid to late 40s, and they tend to lean slightly right of center, either economically or otherwise. So it's like, if this is who's buying these businesses, and if this is who the demographic is, why not throw a chum in the water and have the fish swim to my my platform? So, so you're saying that you have that approach, and it may not even reflect your own personal um, political or economic stance, but that's where your target market is. So you might yeah. as well cater to that. Right. Correct. Yep. Wow. That's uh, 
And you know, it kind of makes sense because if you think about it, who's going to want to go roll their sleeves and buy an HVAC business or or something like that or a landscaping business? Right. I'm sure female, you know, a a woman or or females can do that, but who would want to do that? Right. I would assume mainly mainly men. I'm sure there's women as well that do that. Right. um, Are you seeing, that's interesting actually, are you seeing most of your deals in kind of these, could I say blue collar type industries? Most of them predominantly, yes. I've seen um, recently an uptick in people looking at like the e-commerce SaaS type companies. I, I think like yours, for example, I believe. But um, predominantly the, the trades, the, the blue collar industries. Got it. So that, that kind of makes sense why that would be your, your target market. Yeah. Yeah. Let me read one of your posts that I was, I was oh, looking yeah. at your, uh, <laughs> your Twitter. I won't do the crazy... Uh, uh, is, it one on, is it one on PGs or is it something else? So here's an interesting one you wrote. Uh, <laughs> I think you got a thousand likes as well. Is, uh, I think I know the one. <laughs> <laughs> guys, if you're coming from a white collar background, think twice about buying a landscaping business or similar without a general manager at a minimum. Having to confront an employee about, okay, so this is the one, about taking a, a crap in someone's front yard when your background is making waterfall models on Wall Street is probably going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was, we, we kind of talked about <laughs> that tweet towards the start of this podcast episode. That, that, that happens. I have a good friend that owns a landscaping company in Ann Arbor, Michigan. His name's Carson. And that exact thing hasn't happened, but things like that, right? And this is probably actually a good topic of discussion for the podcast, especially for listeners coming from white collar backgrounds, you know, finance, banking, consulting, office jobs, office jobs. And all of a sudden, you know, the workforce of the company that you're buying is completely different to you. And you have to find a way to relate to them. And these could be people that don't have reliable cars that, you know, maybe they show up for work potentially drunk because they might have situational issues going on or like they're they like all this crazy stuff can happen out there. And I think Lots of people get drawn to this space by influencers on Twitter that put the glamour out there. And I try to be pretty blunt saying like, hey, this isn't for everyone. And I think some people are honestly in for a rude freaking awakening. Yeah, no, I could I could totally see that. And I've heard stories. I've heard horror stories of friends who have either interned at or actually been part of the buying of a business, uh, window installation, uh, you mentioned HVAC, plumbing businesses, all types of landscaping type businesses. They're not easy to run. The management of those employees, you know, you got a 30, 50 person workforce. They might not be college educated. They might not be, um, they, they, yeah, like you said, they might be transient in certain ways. Yeah. And there's a lot of turnover that can happen as well. And there can be like, you know, some things go on. Um, for example, I, and show again to Nolan just for giving some fodder for this podcast. I think it was him or someone similar that posted about, you know, um, historically in the past, everyone at the company he'd bought got certain days off at the end of the year. Maybe they got the whole week off. And he's like, hey, I, I can't do that now as the buyer, but you might go into diligence not knowing that. And then you close on the acquisition target or the business you're buying. And all of a sudden, some of these cultural things come up. And not specific to landscaping or the trades, but just in general, surprises that come up post acquisition where you can't really claw below the surface to get all of that when you're going into the diligence process. Right. It's not something you just see on your desktop. Correct. It's not in the data room. (laughs) (laughs) And some people might be accustomed to relying on the data room and transactions going well in the corporate world. Right. But this is a little bit different. Correct. Uh, completely. So based on this, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, uh, what, what are your thoughts on white collar people, quote, quote, unquote, or corporate people? Like just generally? or Buying, like, oh. buying these, these, these businesses. Like, cause I, I think what the reason why they're interested in this, yeah. which I can sympathize with or empathize with, is probably this vision of, oh, well, I'm going to have more control over my schedule. Yep. I'm going to be an owner. I'm going to be a CEO. I have the ability. We went through some of the math. You know, I'm going to have the ability to own a $5 million business fully, fully paid for in 10 years or more, yeah. right? And collect a higher salary while controlling my schedule and being my own boss. 
I think, yeah, so generally speaking... What would be your response to that? To somebody thinking about... Yeah. Thinking from those perspectives and trying to go buy an HVAC business or another business. I think there are a lot of fucking shallow people (laughs) out there (laughs) that are searchers gaining the space a lot of the time, you know, for the, the wrong reasons, right? Just like the money in the sense. They see, you know, someone that Stanford study did this. Maybe they're a traditional searcher. Or like they read the self-funded searcher study from the the SIG guys or whatnot. Yeah, and why they, don't you explain that real quick? What's the Stanford study? What's the the SIG study? Yeah, SIG? so there, the Stanford study, I, I can't remember the year it came out, but basically it shows the economic returns behind search in the traditional space. You probably know more about it than me, just given the fact that they pimped the traditional model in business school. Um, the self-funded model that the Search Investment Group commissioned basically shows like what the economic returns are to these self-funded searchers and the composition of different debt structures, equity structures, things of that nature. And so basically where I was trying to go with this comment, not to dig too much into the academia here, is I think there are people that look so much at the numbers and less at the actual qualitative, like, hey, do I want to actually be in the trenches learning this business, interacting with this workforce? They're seeing, you know, in the Stanford study, there's... Yeah, a large percentage, actually, not as many as people would think, but they they look at the stats where there are uh, a number of people within five years um, exiting with millions of dollars. Right. Of so equity. yeah, people look at that. They look they, at the, they think I want a multi million dollar payday. They look at the numbers. They yeah. hear all these stories about like the Harvard graduate or MBA that rolled up these businesses, made all this money, but they don't think about like what actually goes into getting that done. And when you're doing a traditional based deal, you know, you're buying a bigger company that's likely to be more stabilized, excuse me, and more turnkey than some of these SBA finance companies where you're going to be more in the trenches. And I think there are lots of people that don't appreciate everything that goes into the op standpoint of these businesses. And those people, I think specifically, if they aren't really going into that during the operational due diligence and figuring out what does the seller do? What does Jane the GM do? Is this person planning to stay after the sale takes place? Do they know the business is for sale? And figuring out what they're going to have to absorb as far as like the slack, you know, and the rope, metaphorically speaking, those people are going to be in for rude awakening, I think. Yeah, that is very good. A good warning, people. Yeah. Trying to embark on this space. It's not only... It's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. And speaking from personal experience... A lot of work. It's a lot of work, and it's a lot of work when you get the business. It's it's hard to get the business too. To find yeah. the business, convince the seller to sell to somebody that's 28, 30, 32 years old, yep. who comes from white collar corporate job or something else, and trying to convince them that you can take over this business. Yeah, and the banks convincing everyone. In somewhat kept back as a segue, not to go back to the social media Twitter stuff, but yeah. just for the purposes of that. One of the reasons I try to stir the pot again, like a lot and put out posts, whether it be on Shria's Law or other things, to really <laughs> to really try to spur some people's feathers is during the financing process and the deal process, it's not a fucking walk in the park, just to be blunt. And a lot of times there will be things that will go not to plan. And some people will soldier through that and battle through it and get to the other side and others won't. And I'm basically trying to self-select and weed out the people that are going to get their feathers ruffled when things go adversarial, not according to plan. And part of my thesis with Twitter is by stirring the pot a bit, the same people that I think are not going to soldier through the deal process are going to be the ones that will get their feathers ruffled. I'd rather have those people not reach out to me or unfollow me than bring them halfway or through the way through the process Things don't go according to plan. They throw their hands up and they just say, I'm done. That's really interesting. So you're actually trying to kind of disqualify certain uh, deal flow from people that you don't think are actually, they have the grit to really close a deal, to, to actually become an operator and become an entrepreneur in this space. Correct. Yeah, I'm trying to, in some ways, play the equivalent of Survivor with my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm assuming you get a lot of inbound. Yeah. You probably get too much now. Yeah. Because I get a lot of inbound. Right. And I only have 5,000 followers on LinkedIn. I don't even go on Twitter. Yeah. And I get quite a bit of inbound of people saying, hey, can I get advice on doing a search fund or doing right. a deal? Or I have a deal. Can you give me some advice? And I'm sure you get 10, 20 times, 50 times that. Probably. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll get maybe 250 emails some days. Everything from someone like, hey, here's a biz buy sell listing. Is this fundable? 
just like with a link to the listing. <laughs> um, and typically, some of those I ignore. Um, so, <laughs> so people that are sending full blown. They've clearly not done their homework if right. they're just sending a link to Biz Buy Sell. Right. To people where they're sending like the whole one pager, like, hey, here's my background. Here's one thing about source and uses, like the more sophisticated people like yourself. And they've thought through the deal, they know how they want to approach it, but they're looking more from the validation, like, hey, is this actually fundable? What do you think I could get good debt terms? Do you see any problems with this customer concentration? The short term nature of like how EBITDA has been where it is and the seller is placing the valuation on it. Do you think that will be an issue from a business valuation standpoint? Like the the sharper kind of subset of people in the space. Do you think that you know you kind of raised a couple points there of you're looking for people that are thinking thoughtfully and they understand the business fundamentals of the acquisition they're trying to do both they understand it from a structure standpoint from a financial standpoint from an operational standpoint and they're taking it seriously so but you've also mentioned that people coming say from a white collar corporate background sometimes aren't the best fit for these types of acquisitions so who do you think are the best acquirers of these businesses who's the best or, or, or not saying best, but who who are the the people most suited for these types of acquisitions? So yeah, circling back on that, I mean, I think the white collar profile is fine if it's someone that's buying a company with a GM or similar, or the owners plan to stay on for a certain period of time after closing to kind of help with the M and A integration. But I think in general, you know, people that have grit that you know has either been demonstrated through their career or maybe military background or or similar or, you know there are some like pro athletes or whatnot getting to the space but people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and really get into the trenches and figure it out right like the the, the type of person where if you threw them off the boat onto like a, a, a nomadic island and you gave them like a piece of flint and some wood like they could make a fire and you'd come back two days later and there would be like a pig roast going on. That's the type <laughs> of person that I think is going to get through this process well. Yeah, I think we're looking for people or you're looking for people and, and the space is looking for people that are resourceful. Correct. That no matter what happens, whether in the search process, the deal closing process, the bank process, the post-close operational process, HR, all that stuff, they're willing to just roll up their sleeves and Persevere. Correct. And find yep. a solution. Yep. It's fascinating. Um, I think we're almost out of time, which is which is really unfortunate because we've got a list of so many topics we wanted to talk about. Do some hot takes or <laughs> yeah, like I don't know how much time. Like, where's our production? Is our production? How much time we got left? Like, yeah, we got five yeah. minutes. So like, we got to kind of close maybe, off. Maybe two hot takes real quick. Yeah, we yeah. should get some two hot takes because like I wanted to go through like yeah. personal guarantees, interns. Uh, we'll do a part two at some point. Multiple deals. I think we should do part two at some point. But yeah, you have any hot takes you want to you share with I'd the audience? I'd take one. I yeah. would never buy a business I would not personally guarantee. I okay. view the personal guarantee, whether you have access to non-personal guarantee, non-recourse debt. Can you just explain what personal guarantee is? Yeah. For people that don't know. Personal guarantee, super high level because we only have five minutes left. Essentially, if you, you sign on a document and if the deal goes sideways, the bank can go after everything you own, more or less. So I so would. So if the business can't pay back the loan, then they can go back and get your house or your other assets. Yep, they can go after you know your ugly Christmas sweater to your coin collection to your bank account. So. And why do you think people should do that? I so. Why would you want to do that? The reason I would not buy a business I want personal guarantee is because you use the PG as a gut check: is this a good deal or a bad deal? If you aren't willing to more or less sign your assets on the line, maybe it's an indication that it's not as strong of a deal as you think it is. Wow. That, that's hot take number one. Um, right. What's number two? You have some in your book. You throw, <laughs> you throw one at me. I, I um, give you some ideas. Yeah. I mean, we were going to talk a little bit about the intern culture oh, within uh, ETA yeah. search funds. Hot take number two. <laughs> if you're And in, you have an intern at Emory. I have two at Emory yeah. as well. And you we don't even live go, in Atlanta. We won't go into the economics of my intern because I don't want to yeah, 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 no, 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 no. cancel here. <laughs> no. Hot take number two is you should be willing to intern for a searcher unpaid because the experience will be invaluable. And you should be less focused on the money, more focused on the experience and what money the experience will lead to down the road. Right. 
And so from the searcher perspective, they should be able to get interns for free. So the, so the hot take there is you should be embracing free labor as a searcher. <laughs> well, that's pretty, yeah. <laughs> Keep merging um, high, guys. Keep merging high. Yeah, Joe, yeah, Joe exactly. Coslo. For those that don't know, there's a community online called searchfunder.com, which at least that's where I've sourced my interns. Uh, I did, had four last fall. I have, two, I have three actually this semester. Nice. Two are at Emory. Uh, here in Atlanta. You have them do competitions, like run up the mountains to see who like, wins. <laughs> <to get> the... <laughs> there is a little bit of competition between the interns, which is good. A healthy tension is good. You always. give them swords or like... <laughs> <laughs> I give them uh, words of affirmation if they do a good job. Got it. But, but really, uh, you know, the, the interns... What I, what I tell people that, that reach out to me say, hey, I really want to learn about search. I want to do ETA. Someone might be working a corporate job. Someone might be a student. Um, and, and they say, hey, what should I do? What books should I read? I say, go intern. Go part-time, 10 hours a week maybe, for 12 weeks, and work for free, just like you said. Yeah. Work with someone like myself. Work with, work with Matthias. Work right. with an actual searcher. Try to see what it's like to find a deal, to close a deal, to do diligence a deal, to operate a deal, any aspect of the deal cycle. Go intern for 12 weeks. If you're going to commit two years, up to two years to try to find a deal and close a deal, and then five to seven years, which is the average hold period of a search fund deal, you just spend 12 weeks, 10 hours a week. Right. Try, to see, try to see what that's like. See if you like it. See if you like it. See what you learn. See what questions you might have. I mean, all your questions you might have, they're going to get answered in 12 weeks. See how much good. work is to find a deal before you quit your full-time job and have to find exactly. a deal. <laughs> well, uh, Matthias, I think we're literally in the last uh, minute or so. Um, I guess, you know, usually when I close off, I, I like to ask the guests, you know, what advice would you have for somebody that is thinking about breaking the formula in whatever sense? Whether ETA, search fund, starting their own firm, starting their own company, what advice would you have for them? Yes, yeah, so the biggest advice I would say is don't overthink it. If you, you know, if you think it's the right move, trust your gut and just act with conviction. That's beautiful. At the end of the day, there's never a rational reason to do something, you, you got to just do it. You got to just jump in. Just do it. N Nike, right? <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> well, Matthias, uh, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure meeting you here in Atlanta and having you on and uh, wish you the best of luck with your firm. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Looking forward to continued collaborations.